Hello, my fellow Westorians. We are live. It is Sunday. No. We're not? It is. We are live, but it is not switching still. It was switching. Well, what? Am I on or no? They can hear you. <laughs> hey, then, everybody. <laughs> I didn't Let didn't know you could hear me. your lips, and it'll be Aziz. What? Is it me? Um, no, they can see you is the issue. They cannot see its ease, but they can hear you both. Okay. Well, we have a slight issue that Ashea is working on, but we are, since y'all can hear me, we are going to get going. It is our wrap-up episode for A Clash of Kings. We have done a nice solid 12 episodes of chapter by chapter, and now it's time to look at the book as a whole. So that is what we are here to do. And I hope you are ready to tackle the whole book, A Clash of Kings. We have some lovely guests with us today. Ashea is here as usual, but she is not on mic today. But we do have the our lovely returning guest, Lady Gwen from Radio Westeros. Hey, how you doing? I'm very good. Hello. Happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. Hope you had a happy holidays up there. I was just visiting with y'all up in uh, the Boston area, having fun in the snow different for yes. me <laughs> yes you were as soon as you left the snow melted but it's coming back so. <laughs> <laughs> and our other guest also well known to the folks around here your insights are part of almost every valar we read us episode welcome back to the show sir buckley hello how are you glad to be back it's yeah time well, seven months. I missed it, the last one. Has it been that long? Well, it does yes, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It does kind of fly by, doesn't it? Yeah, we weren't. We we had a a little missed connection there on the Game of Thrones wrap up episode. You couldn't quite make that's that right. one. But that's right. Yeah, here this time. Yep, right on. And let's let everyone know about your castles book. We've been talking about it lately, but it's still pretty fresh. And I bet you're pretty proud of that, huh? Yeah, I've been very happy. People have been nice enough to send me pictures of uh, either receiving or giving it as a present. Lady Gwyn is one of them. Yes. And uh, yeah, that's very <laughs> that's a very high compliment that people think it's nice enough to um, to be given as a present. I've been using it to weigh my Dreamcast down. It makes my Dreamcast work. So that's for <laughs> another use if, you've, uh, if you need another one. Keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <good work. laughs> well said, well said. Well, we got a, uh, a a super chat here from uh, wait, who was that from? Danny McKay. From Danny McKay that says, "I heart Valerie Redis." Yes, that is what it comes out as. Valerie Redis is what um, it looks like if you are uh, looking at our one of our episodes with captioning. That is how the closed captioning system translates the word Valar. Reredus. It says Valerie Redis. So it's kind of like almost two person's names, Rita with an S and Valerie. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> this episode, like all of our episodes, is brought to you by our patrons, uh, such as History of Westeros's first sword, Jeff Gnarly. I'm sorry, he's not the first sword. He's the long snapper. Our first sword is... Uh, no, he is our first sword. <laughs> I'm all discombobulated. First sword, Jeff Gnarly the Long Snapper. Been with us a long time, but apparently my memory is faulty this morning. And of course, our Dragon Rider patron, Telenius the Talon, King of Gagasos, Rider of Telerius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of Midnight Black. Okay, so uh, a couple of quick announcements, very quick announcements. We don't have a Valar Reredus episode next Sunday. We might have something, depending on how our schedule goes. We're taking one week to catch up on extra projects that we have, uh, a, a backlog of non valor readers things that I'm going to try to do as much of as possible in that time. But we do have an episode on January 7th. That's a Tuesday. It's our first Tuesday stream in a couple months. We do those semi-regularly, and it's going to be kind of a special one. It's going to be on the War of Nine Penny Kings, and it'll be, which, aka, sometimes called the Fifth Blackfire Rebellion. It's not truly a rebellion, but it's definitely Blackfire related. And that'll be, like I said, Tuesday, January 7th, with Stephen Atwell. So that'll be really cool. Check that out. And we'll be back on the Valar Reredus grind with A Storm of Swords, Episode 1, starting on Sunday, January 12th. Now let's get to this. Often the second installment or act in a series is the saddest one. 
Sometimes it introduces new challenges, or often really, and many of which the, the heroes or antagonists, or rather protagonists, survive, but do not defeat. This sets up the triumph in the third book, or movie, or what have you. And of course, The Song of Ice and Fire is more than three. But it was designed to be a trilogy initially, and some of those elements are still there. And it still has that feel in certain parts, because in a lot of ways, the first three books are sort of like an act one. And this, you know, Feast for Crows and A Dance with Dragons kind of start the next act. So Clash of Kings does have, have that feel of a second act where things go wrong. The story is at first united by the comet, but then everyone kind of splits apart. It definitely has that Empire Strikes Back thing going for it where basically everyone you're rooting for is in a worse spot than they were when before, before the book started. Or at best, they're in a similar spot, like Arya or Sansa. But even then, they've heard news of their brothers, in this case. False news, in this case, but it's real to them. They think it's real. Catelyn is hit by that more than anyone else. So the Starks are further separated from each other. Theon ceases to be one of them, but doesn't make much of an Ironborn either. Jon wanted to be a Stark, a bit like Theon, but first he joins the Night Watch, and then he's joined the Wildlings. He's getting even farther away. Danny learns a lot about her future, but learns very little about how to make it actually happen. It's hard to end up in a worse place than Davos did, though Theon succeeded. And Tyrion does so much only to be rewarded with, what, medical care? I mean, jeez. Meanwhile, the bad guy type characters get stronger. Tywin and Roose do well, and their henchmen do too. So does Ramsay. Joff fails upward spectacularly. Littlefinger... Climbs the ladder of chaos almost as spectacularly, maybe more spectacularly, depending on your view. He efficiently capitalizes on ignorance everywhere around him. Varus goes from omnipresent to gone, but seemed to benefit from the realm tearing itself apart. He certainly benefited from Stannis losing. Balon's plan was terrible, but it was terrible in the long term. And the short term was good for him, and the, this book is where that short term lies. So a lot of these characters, though, that, that had setbacks or that faced challenges and failed... At least they learn something. They're at least stronger and more experienced and ready for those adventures and challenges. So we're going to go through the chapters, uh, the POV arcs, in, a, in an order. We're going to start with Bran, then do Arya, Sansa, Catelyn, uh, Jon, Theon, Davos, Danny, and finish with Tyrion. Starting with, so we start with the Starks, then go with the extended Stark family of Catelyn and Jon, and then Theon is the r r extremely extended Stark family. <laughs> and then people who don't have much to do with the Starks at all, Davos, Danny, and Tyrion. We'll start off with some with a, a quick question for our guests. Since this is a reread, of course, and since so much has happened since most of our uh, most of us did a reread, uh, I'll start with you, Lady Gwyn. Which characters l kind of felt different or stood out the most post Game of Thrones TV and Fire and Blood and all that? Mm, well, I guess specifically to those things, Bran. Um... You know, obviously, because I'm just reading Bran differently post Game of Thrones. I'm looking for things. I, you know, I just have a much more critical eye to him. Cat uh, didn't really change that much for me with relation to other things that happened, but um, just every time I reread Clash of Kings, Cat stands out because she's, in my opinion, she's the best uh, point of view in that book. So <laughs> she's standout. Right on. Um, what about you, Joe? Uh, what stood out for you differently this time around? Uh, I'm much the same as Lady Gwyn. I don't think Catelyn uh, changed me all that much on a reread, but uh, again, she's my favorite character, not just in this book, but in all of them, and um, favorite POV, so I, I just pay special attention to her. I guess what stood out most for me this time is not, not even so much POV characters, but through John's arc, uh, just my opinion on Jill Mormont just completely flipped 180. I think I was quite show influenced before. Kind of, he and Jorah are both pretty nice in the show and uh, not so much in the book. Mm. And yeah, I just had a. Well, if, I know a lot of you guys have been listening to um, Scraps and Scrolls as well, and I go on a lot about G or Mormont. <laughs> now I do not like him so much after the <laughs> week. Well, that's a good uh, segue. Actually, we should mention Scraps and Scrolls. A lot of people follow along with that. It's the Isle of Faces podcast. I know that some people associate it with the, with its real name, but Scraps and Scrolls is is the nickname series for the the Valar Reredis uh, add on, um, for lack of a better word, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so a lot of people a lot of people definitely listen to that. It's really good, and it, there's so it, it just proves how much there is to say about every chapter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
For me, um, I think that I, I definitely agree with Lady Gwen on Bran. I, I'm particularly keyed in to look for differences on Bran. I think I noticed more in A Game of Thrones that stood out to me than I did in A Clash of Kings as far as things that were a little different. But related to that, I certainly got more out of Jon's arc in part because some of the stuff Joe said about Corrin, I think that's um, was interesting to me, just how much he planned ahead. But also just his peculiar dream and how that all the, we, we dug in very deeply on how it's strange, how his first dream wolf dream started and how it's brand not being able to remember it. That was something pretty interesting to me. And also surprisingly, um, Theon actually reads a lot differently to me. I'm really curious about how he's going to end in the books because he's clearly not going to, you know, be speared by the night King. Um, he could just be killed by the others. And that might be a similar ish way to go out. Like, trying to help the Stark, something like that. But I, I, I wouldn't assume that. So I uh, would have to say that um, his, his looking to his future is really interesting and wondering what's going to happen with him. And also uh, keying in more on Tyrion um, and his just how looking for signs of his darkness and pending turn uh towards um maybe not being such a good guy if he even was in the first place i think he still reads as a good guy to me most of the time it's just uh he's a lot more gray so um let's start with bran and then we'll take uh we'll let a few questions more questions uh come in from the listeners and a few questions that we've already uh pulled from patrons and flick and facebook ahead of time so bran uh he starts the 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 book with as a prince and he's very much resistant to the notion of having powers and being a beastling especially because he was raised to think those things were wrong and kind of evil or or at least uh, an evidence of of you being a bad person or a bad guy but by the end of the book he's enjoying being in summer he's enjoying being uh in the crypts he likes the darkness a bit and that's a bit ominous in some ways and I'm not sure I ever thought too much about how similar the darkness and, and depth and bones in the crypts are so similar to Blood Raven's cave and how that is, uh, you know, a, a big, important future part of his future. So, uh, Joe, we'll start with you this time. If you want to say a few words about uh, Bran's arc as a whole and whether I have a question for you as well, whether you think he will leave the... Uh, leave blood raven's cave later or whether he'll whether this foreshadowing for him liking being in the crypts is is foreshadowing him preferring to stay there yeah let me i'll answer that first to be honest after this reread i've probably changed my mind and now i think that he will i'm less likely to think he will leave the cave there's a lot more pointing me towards him staying there's a lot more the supernatural stuff is jumping out at me a lot more this time especially the kind of time travel -y evidence that he's going to end up doing something like that something like that you mentioned john's weird dream we have um i at harren hall's like hearing voices that she's not she's not remembering something she's hearing new voices there's kind of creepy stuff going on and it's um yeah it just leads me to that theory that he's going to end up guiding the, the stark siblings into their specific roles as he goes further so i wouldn't be surprised if he's puppet man basically up there in the cave mm -hmm. and doesn't actually get to partake in any of that but i'm hoping not because if he does have that power i'm guessing he's never used it to uh contact catelyn in any way or touch her so mm. that's bad. that makes me sad <laughs> yeah that's definitely what jumped up jumped out at me most this time the, the supernatural stuff is really coming off the page to me this time that's a good point about how he he seems to speak to his father but maybe can't speak to his mother maybe that's just because of her birth you know being a, yeah she, I don't know she, if it's not, just lack of wolf blood yeah it could be something as simple as that but it's a it's a good uh, that's a good notation there. So, Lady Gwen, what about you? What do you think about uh, this question? Yeah, I think um, I actually think still always thought that he will leave the cave, but I did notice, you know, he says I, I like it in the dark. Uh, so I think maybe he'll leave the cave uh, reluctantly. Hmm. Yeah, I was more inclined to think that it will be more of um, he's become very comfortable there, uh, but he kind of has to give up something else i mean this is going to be all about him giving up parts of himself right from the beginning to the end yeah 
So, um, yeah, and you know what you said about him not talking to Cat. I mean, that's that's awful. But you know, she's when do we see Cat in front of a heart tree? I mean, other than the beginning of Game of Thrones. <laughs> also a good point. Yeah, she does not like yeah. the God's Wood. <laughs> it's, yeah. that's the first I mean, line of her entire arc. Catelyn Stark did not like this God or right. something like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so a big, another big part of Bran's arc, and it's a big part of a lot of characters' arcs, and this is one thing that can dramatically shift the number of chapters or the length of chapters they have, which is how much of a role they play as a witness. For example, Bran, he's a witness to the North tearing itself apart, or the beginnings of that, not the whole thing, but the beginnings of the North tearing itself apart. For example, the Boltons and the Manderleys doing their thing uh, that starts off with the, the Hornwood scenario. So... And that really has shown up when Bran leaves Winterfell. He's no longer a witness to politics. And he's got he's had 14 chapters so far. He's only got seven more. Uh, of course, there'll be more in The Winds of Winter. But that is a big part of that is his, he no longer functions as a witness character. We're going to be seeing that with a lot of other characters as well and seeing how it impacts their POV as we go through. So and Bran is a good way to introduce that subtopic for this episode and, and taking a look at how much certain characters are on screen, in part because of what they need to witness. Obviously, when we get to Catelyn, that's a big thing, too. She travels around and, and is our viewpoint into the Baratheons and uh, several other things. So, uh, And then w the same thing is true for Ned being at King's Landing, doing, his, doing all his things while also having things happening around him. And that uh, mantle is taken up by Tyrion, who, of course, we'll discuss last. Now, the, super, the supernatural stuff... That's a big part of Bran's arc that's huge that we all have at least an opportunity to look at differently given what we saw in the TV show. Uh, Joe, you weighed in a bit on this already. Lady Gwen, what do you think about the, the supernatural elements? Did you, do you see anything differently this time around? Anything major or minor? No, I mean, I was, I was just keyed into his, you know, his learning arc and how early it started uh, with even with May, as early as Maester Lewin teaching him things about the North, about history, and then, of course, Jojen. And, and he's moving on to, you know, his next kind of mentor, right? So um, he's really setting the stage, I think, in this book for a much bigger supernatural role. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. I mean, he's, he's not doing a lot. I, I found Bran to be... Other than, you know, he's a witness. He's kind of in stasis a lot of the time in this in this whole narrative. So that's a great point, actually, because you think about him as being the ultimate witness for so long. And then he's going to be perhaps the ultimate mover and shaker of things, of events mm. like near the end. Uh, that, right. that would be quite a flip. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that really starts at the end of this book when he just, you know, he's going to leave home behind and mm. off he goes. So, you know, he's yeah. more in motion now. Um, then he'll probably be um, going forward as well. So. Yeah, that was a big thing. We, we tried to key in and on the last, the, the final two Valerie Reedus episodes regular um, because you get everyone's final chapters in that stretch. And you and we were we, you want to compare where they start to where they end up. And of course, we did that at the beginning of the section, but we're doing that for all these characters. Uh, one thing we didn't necessarily mention, though, is the, the this very straightforward Bran being at Winterfell through the whole ep through the whole book, only to leave right at the end, and that's where he'll he'll pick up in a storm of swords with his first, uh, the first parts of that journey away from Winterfell. Okay, first set of questions. Uh, Flory's the Fox. Oh, one. What is everyone's favorite <coughs> non POV character in this book? That is a good question. Uh, Joe, how about we start with you this time? You have a favorite non-POV. All right, That's yeah. Be Corrin. Straight and easy. <laughs> he's not there very long. Uh, shorter than I remember it, definitely. I think it's just three chapters he's in, maybe four. But um, what you get is pretty much just pure quality the whole way. He doesn't have a, a boring sentence or anything like that. So, yeah. It, yeah, easy choice for me. That's an efficient mentor, isn't it? <laughs> he's, yeah. He gets right get to the done. point, does all these things. In and out. With the action happening all around them. Yeah, it's true. And uh, what's neat about Corrin, too, is that he's such a badass, but it's all reputation. The only time he draws his sword is to fight John. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so he doesn't, it's all done by, by reputation. There's no, you don't actually have to see him fight to know, just to see how seriously everyone takes him, both his own friends and, and compa companions and the, uh, the wildlings as well. Lady Gwen, what about you? 
Well, I find favorites really hard. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you know me well, I'll, you know, I just I always want to pick multiple favorites. So I'm going to say um two because Renly and Stannis um I I love reading their their interaction and I love reading you know sort of trying to untangle all the politics and the plotting and everything that surrounds them uh, in this book from the very beginning uh, with the Crescent Prologue and Stannis and, you know, right on through to the end. Um, I just find all that so fascinating. So um, the Baratheon brothers. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right on. Well, I, I have to agree. I won't say Corrin's my favorite, but I'll, I'll definitely give him a nod because he stood out to me a little extra this time too, thinking more about John's future arc in terms of post uh, wall and, and post Danny. That's the part that I think a lot of us hadn't given a lot of thought to before the TV show, or at least not thought, at least weren't too sure what to do with those thoughts. Now we have a little, a, lot, a little or a lot more clarity. There was a, a lot more of us. I think we're focused on whether John would be King or, uh, and and that sort of thing. Whereas if the show is accurate, he's not king. Well, not not meaning king on the Iron Throne, not even for a second. But he is king in the North, and well, obviously that's going to have a lot to do with the wildlings and all that, and, and how he unites the, and, and handles the the separation of culture and all these things. So I would also, but I would also like to throw in um, Sandor. I think Sandor is super interesting. He's he's kind of an easy choice, but rehashing some of his his relationship with. Sansa, knowing, at least thinking, that it's not going to be a romantic thing. You know, it could be, but I, I, I never thought it probably would be. The show maybe confirmed that. It's not confirmation, but it's evidence. And I think I prefer it that way, but I st still want them to have a relationship, just not a romantic one. And I think that, um, I think you could see, uh, maybe it's just that I, I'm seeing what I want to see, but I, I think there's plenty of evidence that, he sees her more of like a little bit like the sister he used to have and has a protective instinct that isn't necessarily, uh, you know, all about um, having a, you know, a relationship with her that's physical. So we'll have to see on that. Uh, but let's move on. Nina Friel wants to know what how it will look for Bran if he has the supernatural puppeteer aspect. Does that remove agency from the rest of the Starks. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll start off on that one and let you guys uh, answer afterwards. I'd say it, it, it kind of could depend. It, it definitely could remove a sense of agency from them if he's manipulating things uh, in a overhanded or, sp uh, or uh, thorough manner. But if he's just tweaking, maybe move, doing little things, little moves, uh, maybe tweaking one person here and there, it really depends. I think that also it depends on when this happens, meaning is Arya already super well developed? Is she kind of on her own being extra independent? You know, uh, what is what is John doing by that point? What is Sansa doing by that point? Certainly he's not going to this won't affect, you know, Catelyn or Ned too much at all, or at all unless we find out that he was impacting them from the from the future. And that's a big part of it. Right. If he's impacting people from the future, the timeline is, is really hard to, to figure out the when. When doesn't have meaning when the timeline can be impacted linearly like that. Uh, Lady Gwen, what do you think about this this question? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you could see it that way, but I, I would say if he is a puppeteer, I think more like, you know, like Dumbledore or, um, or Gandalf, you know, that sort of like someone the the sorcerer kind of figure who's you know bringing knowledge or making things happen but not in a way that really takes power away from the rest of the characters in the story if you think about those particular stories um, so i guess i agree with you that it doesn't necessarily mean a loss of agency so it could but it doesn't automatically mean that is maybe yeah okay well joe what do you think yeah, I think we have to remember to give the Stark siblings credit where they deserve it and kind of separate which bits Bran might be influencing and which bits are coming from themselves. Like Sansa's uh, Snow Winterfell is 100% her. That's her bringing herself back. Uh, same with Iron multiple times. I, I definitely hope he doesn't come to the point where he is literally just pushing them around. But I think, it, like you say, he's just kind of a hint there and just when needed, uh, a reminder. I, I also think it's... 
I don't think Brown will ever get to the point, at least on page, where he's kind of like show Bran, where he's emotionless and just sees them as chess pieces. He's going to have emotional connections to what he's doing. I think that's why he's still uh, talking to Fionn, maybe, through the tree, because he's got such a connection with Fionn, probably the strongest now that Rob's dead. Um, so I don't think it'll ever be just literally him uh, puppeteer. That's probably a bad choice of words by me previously. Hmm, okay. And also perhaps we could say, maybe to add to that, um, that because of the POV nature, it's hard to tell on the show, but the POV nature of the books, when something funky is happening with someone's perception, George tends to write it in a way that, it, that we at least suspect something's happening. For example, when Ari is having her moment at the hmm. tree in Harrenhal, exactly. it really, it's like, what is going on? That really stands out. And, and I think that maybe, uh, there's probably some other examples like that that I'm not coming up with off the top of my head, but uh, maybe maybe Theon in uh, in A Dance with Dragons when he's in front of the Winterfell Heart Tree. That's another example. They really kind of there's 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 clues that something else is going on that there's an outside influence. So I think at least George is going to give us the ability to discern whether there's a, a manipulation happening um, at least inside their head. If it's some you know if it's something like say Blood Raven sending the direwolves, there's no. That's just circumstantial, and you can say, well, it sure, sure is weird that those dire wolves were there at this very particular time, but there's nothing inside someone's head that can tell you. <laughs> so I think, um, I think George gives us the clues um, when, it, when they're supposed to be there. At least we have that to go with. Um, great take by Stefan B, who is a regular a commenter on Flick. Flick is another way to interact with Valerie mm -hmm. Reedus. It's a small community. We have about 330 people on there. Uh, most people are just, just reading and uh, the occasional comments, but it's a really uh, useful way to very tightly uh, comment on each chapter without um, the, the perils of social media. <laughs> and uh, there's no trolls and, and uh, just random people around. It's all people who are bought into Valerie Reedus. So, uh, Stefan B. says... This, on a deeper level, this book features learning how to cope in an alien environment. John learns to be a ranger and then a wildling. Tyrion is honing his skills as a leader and a diplomat, something he hasn't been before. Danny learns how to move in an ancient Esso society. Sansa is at court, which is maybe a little uh, more familiar for her. But Arya lives as a commoner, which she maybe has a disposition for, but isn't something she's super used to. Bran lives in a time of crisis and has all sorts of adaptation uh, for his new skills and new environment. And for Catelyn, everything she's so used to becomes alien. All the all her all the things that are normal to her no longer feel normal because of the fracturing of her family, in particular the death of Ned, and then by the end of the book, her perceived the perceived death of Bran and Rickon. And for Theon, he comes back to Winterfell, but it's a completely new place to, for him because it's you know it's it's despite where he grew up. So that's a great take. I hadn't thought about it that way. Uh, Joe, we'll start with you this time. Um, what did you think about this idea that that this is a, a overall theme for? Uh, going into an environment that is alien or a familiar environment that has since become alien. Yeah, I think it's dead on. You can very much apply it to pretty much every POV, like uh, like Stefan says. I think if, if Theon, you can double up because he's also going back to Pike, and that's nothing like he remembers. Same for uh, similar to Catelyn. I think the Daenerys uh, that really jumps out because she's gone from. Um, where she's just basically second, second fiddle to Drogo the whole way and just basically paraded around to actually being center of attention and suddenly even within the book goes from the red waste where she has obviously has nothing to calf which is the place where they have everything but it's actually of no use anyway so yeah i can definitely i think you can see that on every pov it's a good take right on uh lady gwen what do you think uh yeah i definitely agree these characters are all on a journey and uh this is a part of their journey where they're learning new skills or you know progressing kind of to the next level um so it's definitely a thing i think to apply to all the characters except maybe davos i don't really see i mean he's definitely experiences changes i don't see him necessarily in in this light but everybody else for sure yeah i guess maybe if you were if you were trying to fit davos into that uh category he know, doesn't right. he's never fought in a battle that was one thing i mean that's just part of yeah. His... Yeah, and dealing with all the high lords, that's something new for him. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point for Mashea. Um, he's yeah. a commoner, you know, a POV amongst all these people who he doesn't feel a part of. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that works pretty well. 
Um, and also, I think it applies to quite a few of the uh, non-POV characters um, by the end. You know, Sandor as a Kingsguard is a little... I mean, he, he's technically named the Kingsguard in the Game of Thrones, but most of his arc as a Kingsguard is in Clash of Kings. A Corrin Halfhand, you could say he's adapting to the trees have eyes now. It's, you know, the supernatural is awakening. It's a different... It's a new day beyond the wall, even. Um, and he's been a ranger for, what, something like 30 years or something? And and not, this is nothing like he's ever seen before. So, Yorn as well. Yeah. Yorn real Great point. Very good point. So there, we could probably just keep naming characters and it would, <laughs> it would apply, but we let's move on. Uh, Noga Frankel, if you could have one new chapter from any POV, existing or new, that takes place during A Clash of Kings... Which one would you choose? He sa- or She says, I would like to read a Tyrell POV between Renly's death and the Blackwater, probably in Bitterbridge. Okay, that's a good example. I would take... I've said this already, so um, I'll just rehash what I said during Valoritas because I, I think this one fits really well, and I haven't... If, if I were to spend some time thinking about it, I might come up with another one, but this one pops in my mind, and I'm, I'm sure it'd be good. I would love to have seen the Battle of... Uh, the battle where the where Rob snuck up on um, the Wolf and the Night battle, where they snuck up on Sir Stafford Lannister's host. Uh, I want. I would love to have seen his POV as he was seeing through Grey Wind and and having the confusion of being a warg, and and then just all that action of that battle would have been fun from a wolf's point of view, um, and it would have given George an opportunity to to give us a little more of insight of of Rob as a, as a character and from the inside and what he's dealing with, not just the cool supernatural stuff. Um, Lady Gwen, what do you think? Uh, if you could pick a POV character that's mm-hmm. in there that uh, didn't happen, or one that did happen that didn't um, that took place off page? Yeah. Um, well, I really like the idea of Rob, uh, you know, and Oxcross and the whole uh, that whole journey west. But I think I'd have to go with uh, Littlefinger. Ooh, what the heck is he up to during all this? I mean, we can. <laughs> We've we can guess and speculate, and we have done. We have a four and a half to five hours worth of podcasts on Littlefinger. A lot of that's dedicated to this <laughs> particular subject. Where was he during, um, you know, around the Bitter Bridge, and you know when he was out of King's Landing and all that stuff? So, um, yeah, that's would definitely be pretty revealing. Joe, what about you? Uh, well, I guess a brief one. I'd quite I'd be interested to see Stannis. Uh, have a POV at the time of Renly's death to see if George mm-hmm. kind of writes it like a, a wolf dream where he's kind of half there and half not. That would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm going to cheat a bit because it's not a, a new POV, but I I really want Cersei's POV for a lot of Tyrion's chapters. Oh. I'd love to see her her view on things, especially mm-hmm. um, when she has um, Shatea, when she's in the Blackwater. Just love to see what she's thinking. If George offered me... Uh, Cersei POV in this book or in Feast, I'd probably take this book to be honest with you. Oh, wow. That's cool. I can see that now that you mention it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Cool. That was a great question. I like thinking about these um, these different perceptions because the kind of thing we try to do sometimes, all of us in, in various methods with our podcast, is try to imagine or at least piece together what was happening with certain characters while they were off page. And this is, this is along that same sort of line of thinking. Um, Anyway, let's move on. Uh, super chat from our f- good friend Tommy Pappas. He says, a good act does not wash out the bad, nor a bad act the good. Each should have its own reward. I think a bad act washed out the good recording we had. <laughs> Shay says, a bad act washes out the good recording. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Oh, well. All right, so let's go to Aria. Aria, Aria. Um what do you guys think as far as George's original plans? He certainly had more. We know that Arya, Catelyn, and and company were going to end up beyond the wall in the original plan for Game of Thrones. That's I guess Catelyn was going to die and become undead way up there rather than in the Riverlands. So do you think, given that Game of Thrones ends with Arya with Yorin, it was perhaps that George's original plan was to have that work, to have Yorin actually get her all the way to Winterfell or to the Wall. What do you guys think there? Um, Joe, you start this time. Yeah, definitely all the pieces are there. Like you say, at Game of Thrones, you can definitely match that to what we uh, kind of know of the rough outline. It definitely would have been a lot nicer end for Yoren, probably, if he uh, got her up there. So I would have liked to see that. But um, 
she does take a, a big leap. I can't. She has like five chapters in Game of Thrones. It's like exactly um, yes. Yeah. So it's a pretty much doubled up on this one. Nearly, she goes really far. So um, that was obvious. A really deliberate choice by George that he was going to really double down on her seeing this side of things. Uh, I think it's important that we get this side of things in this book specifically because although we get the aftermath later. Um, I think it's really important we kind of get the pre-burner and actually everything going wrong through eyes eye. So I think he did make the the right choice to keep her here, even what, if it ended badly for Yoren. What's the what what's the term for an ongoing uh, aftermath when it's ongoing? Is it during math? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it's that's a good point. Like Brienne is our portal into seeing the aftermath of the war uh, mm. more so than any other character by far. Uh, but Arya is that portal during a clash of kings and during quite a bit of a storm of swords when she wanders around the riverlands with the hound so it's very interesting i definitely agree with joe that it was a great choice by george to to show that angle because we don't see the commoners that much um and without aria's this change to aria's arc we wouldn't have there wouldn't have been a lot of opportunity for it and it also gives us these really interesting supernatural plots um you know we get the setup for jock and hagar lady Gwen, what do you think about um Ari is uh, this this potential change in in George's outline and plans for the series. I think that makes sense. It definitely could have been his initial plan, but I think you know, knowing what we do about George, the way he likes to portray war is to show he he wants to show the real effects of war on real people, uh, not just you know the heroes fighting in their battles. So he wants to show the the dead villagers and you know the the soldiers who have been maimed or are broken in many different ways. So I think he made a great choice to make our window into that primarily be um, a little girl who's on this kind of journey of her own, which you know is going to lead her to a very different place, of course. But um, having her her viewpoint into this and particularly it being her and where she um, initially understands things a lot less than we as adult readers even understand things. Um, it, it was uh, very clever and um, yeah, I just think it made her character so much better, gave her such a great foundation for what happens next. Right on. Yeah. So she's pretty much at Heron Hall, not the entire book, but most of it, and when she's not, she's near it. And basically, it's the shadow of Heron Hall before she gets to Heron Hall. So I'd say one change in her character that I would note pretty significantly is that she starts off the, uh, a Game of Thrones and still early a Clash of Kings seeing things very black and white. And she doesn't understand why no one stood up for Micah. She doesn't get why these things that don't work the way she was taught they work. Um, she doesn't understand why people aren't more honorable. It's sort of like Tyrion, what Tyrion taught Jon, but without anyone telling Arya, she just kind of realizes this on her own. And so she's, see, she's seeing things uh, very differently, like the, the worst are doing their worst, of course. We see Tywin and, and Armory Lorch and Gregor and Hote. And then we get this really interesting flip where the good guys, quote unquote, the good guys might be even worse. For one thing, Vargo Hote is as bad as they come, and he just switches sides. Like, why would... How is Rob having this guy on his side? Now, we know Rob didn't choose to, to have Vargo Hote on his side, but the fact that the good guys, the Starks, have Vargo Hote on their side, and then Roos Bolton, of all people, we didn't, and we find out that not only is Roos Bolton on Rob's side, but... He's been horrible this whole time. We just didn't necessarily know it. That's mm -hmm. a big flip for, for someone who sees things in black and white to realize that there's so much nuance to even her own team is a real talk about uh, a rude awakening. So let's, uh, Lady Gwen, let's let you uh, go first this time. Speak to that topic. Yeah, uh, definitely. The, the fact that the good guys and the bad guys are indistinguishable from each other is going to be a huge uh, theme in uh in a storm of swords um so having aria kind of arrive at that place uh prepared by her experiences with Roos, uh who is just horrible to her and you feel that little i was rereading her final chapter uh earlier this week and i noticed that little frisson of fear 
uh, that went through me and I, I think went through her too when he talks about hunting wolves. And you guys probably talked about this when, when you did the chapter, um, but the, the nine dead wolves, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is symbolic of the Stark family and is a big, huge hint that this guy means nothing very good <laughs> <laughs> to <It's>... her family. <laughs> So she's she's just learning that, um, you know, it's sadly it's going to lead to her being pretty cynical. But, there's you know, there are there are no real good guys out there. You could see how seeing a, an attitude of, of, of a rude awakening to the idea that there are no good guys or bad guys that it would allow someone to be more dispassionate about killing, you know, like, well, mm -hmm. no one's a good guy. Like, I'm not killing a good person here. Uh, Joe, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think, I think cynical is a good word for it. You can kind of see it in two uh, parallel paths. So there's a physical, her beginning at the, um, her physical beginning is her like fighting with Hot Pie and Lomi just in the dirt and thinking that, that like, they're the worst. And then obviously she learns that they are, they are not, in fact, the worst. And uh, she <laughs> ends up having to murder uh, guards from her home uh, region in cold blood just to just to save herself but also like her her last chapter in game of thrones is when she's like living on the streets and um it obviously isn't used to it it's a new arena for her so now she's thrown into that completely and she sees how bad they all have it because of things her family and other families are doing i think it's really important uh, symbolically that they have a stark and a baratheon and gendry um witnessing all this i think it would mean a lot less if Davos was seeing all this, because Davos already knows that this it's like this, um, and that's not to say that Arya and Gendry are going to end up in any position where they can uh, avenge it or mm. make up for it in any way. But I just think symbolically, because the series starts under the control of Raffian and Stark as king and um, and hand of the king, to have two members of their family there and seeing the aftermath of what what's happening is um, the, the correct choice for who's actually seeing it. Yeah. You see, yeah. Oh, sorry. You, you, I was going to say that you see her, <clears throat> her idea of who's a bad guy really evolve when she kind of has this almost like buyer's remorse <laughs> at the end over her choices with Jack and Agar uh, as Tywin is leaving. And she's thinking, God, I really screwed up. You know, like Weiss was not really <laughs> He's on the so same unimportant. Level <laughs> yeah. <as Simon. laughs> and she tries to take it back, but you know, it's too late. So um you know, I just I just found that very <laughs> interesting in her evolution as a character. As yeah. She learns the, the badness. <laughs> Think back to a Game of Thrones, her first chapter ends with where she's terror she's like, it wasn't just Septa Mordain. It was Septa Mordain and her mother. Like, oh no, she's going to get in trouble. <laughs> she's going to get grounded. Ah. <laughs> talk, that's, talk about it. You got to start small. Build up from there. <laughs> um, so let's see. Let's move on from Arya. We could, we could have easily spend the whole two hours on any one of these characters, but, you know, we're not going to do that. <laughs> let's talk about Sansa. Um, I'll start off. I'll say Sansa is is moved way, way up the ladder in understanding people. But I wouldn't say she's moved up a lot in understanding politics or institutions. However, that seems to be coming. I think she's going to learn more about those things. That's kind of the next step in her courtly education. First, you, you're just learning the people you interact with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then later you start to understand the structure that's guiding everyone and the history of all those places and why people behave the way they do within those institutions. And that's a little more advanced knowledge. That's, it makes sense that that would come later. Um, Lady, can I start with you here? Uh, what, would you agree with that or have anything to add to that as far as, um, Sansa as a whole? <clears throat> yeah, she's learning, um, a lot about people, uh, about how not to, act uh or or what she wouldn't do you know she's kind of i see a lot of this as kind of like anti anti-mentoring you know look what observing cersei and joffrey and Ooh, uh, anti-mentoring i like that <laughs> yeah a word stolen right from our upcoming podcast episode <laughs> nice nice <laughs> uh so you know i just think that uh she starts out with a very like aria very kind of black and white view of people she thinks joffrey's wonderful and cersei's wonderful because they're the queen and they're the prince and she thinks the hound is horrible because he's awful it, awful gross looking you know what i mean um but near the end 
she's or by the end she's definitely uh, changed her point of view on a lot of people um, so yeah uh, also the hound and dantos are probably the two most prominent characters in her arc for clash of kings and they are an inversion maybe of the angel devil trope one on each shoulder uh they're not really playing that role but you can if you look at it in that way it, it sort of takes you to an interesting spot which is that the one the one who seems like the devil is actually kind of the more of a good guy and obviously dantos is <laughs> a puppet uh being manipulated by one of the worst characters in the entire series so Mm -hmm. uh, that needs a little explanation, but they're both part of her in such an interesting way that she's he's the knight that isn't a knight and he's the fool that isn't a fool. And one is, you know, represents uh, Florian. They're both like aspects of Florian in a different way. And uh, but 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 not at the same time. So, Joe, um, let's hear from you on this. Uh, yeah, I guess two things uh, jumped out for me this time reading Sansa. And I'm glad you put uh, Ally and Sansa next to each other because the biggest thing is that they they both have really strong comparisons all the way through this book there's a lot similar between them even though physically obviously i is moving around and being captured and, and sansa kind of stays still but they both deal with cleganes they're both trying to escape <clears throat> situations in different castles they both have major moments in godswoods and finding themselves and they're most importantly they're both constantly thinking about what a knight or a king or a ruler owes people or a lord and they're thinking about how um how ned taught them about that and actually after this book i think that deviates a lot and you don't get that comparison even though you would think they would get closer because sansa is on a more Aya type uh journey once she leaves king's landing and she has to pretend to be someone else which obviously i has been doing for a long time now but no i think this is the kind of the, the closest their two arcs get um even including game of thrones obviously they're physically closer there and the other thing that jumps out to me, uh, you mentioned Littlefinger there. I don't, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, they don't really interact in this book much at all. It's like a couple of conversations. But this time I've noticed he's, he's just there through her whole, her whole arc, just through, um, through Dontos. And he's actually pretty nonchalant about her. If I'm thinking about it, when he leaves for Bitterbridge, there's a really good chance that Sansa's going to be killed or captured or something in the Battle of Blackwater. And he doesn't seem to have any backup plan to get her out or anything it seems like he's just willing to lose her if it goes that way which just makes him seem all the creepier because if, if he cares about anything it's sansa and he's still just like nah, nah, she died. <laughs> i guess catlin's still alive at this point so he has two yeah, options <laughs> options one. One <laughs> Ugh, little finger so um yeah so let's move on let's move on to catlin actually uh that's a, a good segue there to talk about her uh, she almost literally goes in a circle. She starts at River Run and goes south and comes back to River Run, and all her efforts are fruitless. She tries to do the thing that she almost the same thing she tries to do in a Game of Thrones, where she's like, all these people are all excited about going to war, and she's like, why are you excited about going to war, you idiots? This is not exciting. This is terrifying. And she's just so right about that. And it's 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 sort of a rehashed with a different set of people and cultures. And but with it's, it's done very differently. I'm not saying it's uh, it's it's a rehash in that sense, but it, it is the, sort of that cycle of her being the voice of reason that people just say, yeah, that's you know, that's a good idea. But we're not going to do that at all. That's clearly the momentum is is clearly there's a tidal wave of heading towards war and you are a trickle of, of common sense here. And so the, so both her travel and her efforts can be described similarly. It is, she's She's got the right ideas, but she gets nowhere in trying to implement them because no one wants to listen. No, everyone else has their own goals. They're not they don't care about common justice and things like that mostly people are after power here and catlin is preaching a whole a whole different uh ideal and that's also for her uh in the opposite sense she's not handling uh the, the her, on a personal side of course she's doing terribly because all the things that used to bring her joy are now have turned gray they're like the, the proverbial ashes in her mouth so um with that in mind, let's go to uh, Lady Gwen. And also, if you have different thoughts on Renly this time around, this would be a good time for it. Um, <laughs> but if you want to just focus on Catelyn, go for that too. Okay. Uh, yeah, just I think Cat definitely uh, this 
her arc here is all about her. She doesn't really want to be doing all these things that she's doing. She's going south and south again. She really just wants to be with her kids and she wants to be part of a, a you know, some sort of past that never really actually existed, but she, she just wants to rest and recover from all this stuff. And she just keeps getting pushed further on. Uh, really throughout this book, she's facing the loss of, of all her children with her daughters. Um, and then Bran and Rickon, of course, um, all on top of Ned. But also, um, I find that her facing her loss of Rob, the way an adult child leaves you, you know, uh, is very, very poignant for her. So mm. uh, for me, the cat's arc in this book is just all about her loss. And like you said, kind of the fruitlessness of everything that she's doing. Um, it's it's not good for her. She, she doesn't really make any progress. And uh, I find that very, very sad and compelling and it has a lot of things about real life that we could talk about for hours <laughs> it's not, something that just struck me about it is how similar it is to brienne's take at the inn uh it's no chance and no choice she catelyn yeah. probably knows almost as, as well as brienne that she's not going to change these people's minds but she's yeah. just has to try she just has to has yeah. to try even if it's a 1.1 percent chance it's worth you know trying mm -hmm. to trying to hit that joe what do you think yeah, I, I've said many times, Catelyn's my uh, my favorite. I, I do love this book, even though it's very sad for her, and she goes around not actually getting anything done, but uh, but trying her best, as you say. And it's kind of offset from Rob because in this book he's going everywhere and he is winning uh, for the most part, and it, uh, good things are happening. But actually, at the end, it gains them pretty much the same. Rob doesn't actually gain anything, and neither does Catelyn. Uh, she kind of serves as the the backbone to this. Uh, this book for me because she not only is she physically in the center but she goes around the most uh kingdom she meets the most kings and that, that is in the title of the book um and yeah she's just putting forward this real effort and i think it's her first chapter she's literally just kind of almost walking around in a circle and thinking about all the political parties and kind of nailing it not for, not not everyone but um she has all the right ideas but she can't she doesn't have the the opportunity or the tools to quite put them into practice or get any result out of them. And I think she almost becomes like a meta character when she's with Stannis and Renly and just gets so frustrated. She can so clearly see uh, what the correct option is, but she just can't make them because they're human and they have their own things going on. But she, like, the frustration she feels is, is exactly the same we all feel. And that, Look, it's obvious, just do this and it's, <laughs> it's all solved. Everything will be fine. Yeah, um, and I think that that's her message of this whole book is that everything could have been fine if people weren't so human about it. That's a great point. That's really well said. Also, to add to that, it it, it really gives uh, a poignant ending to well, maybe not ending, but to her transition. She's this voice of reason that no one listens to. It's no wonder she snaps and starts killing everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it. It's like, oh, so this is this is how we roll, huh? We just kill everybody. <laughs> All right, then. I can play that game. I can hang people. Mm -hmm. I can be brutal and bloody. I'll show you. <laughs> so, yeah, so you should have listened to me. Uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> should have... You... Good, nice cat. You should have kept the nice kitty, not the, not the bad kitty. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So let's move on. Actually, one question. Small question here. Forget setting aside the legality, setting aside him jumping in line. What kind of, do you think Renly would have been a good slash decent slash bad king? Forget forgetting whether he had any right to it or not. Let's just say we can ignore all that. It's hard to ignore all that, but let's <laughs> let's pretend we can. Um, Lady Gwen, what do you think? Uh, you know, I would have to say yes, especially if the choice was between the Baratheon brothers. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting. I mean, Renly has really gone back and forth in the fandom, like, like hating him, like thinking he's okay. Like he's really, mm. the cycle of Renly viewing has really been uh, interesting to, to watch. There's someone do a, yeah. someone should do a meta history on the, the <laughs> Renly fandom. <laughs> Where, the, a, pint, a chart or something. Of the Renly uh, line chart. Yeah. I don't know. I just think if, you know, if you take him out of, out of the conflict with the brothers, but you know, just say which, which one objectively would it would be better? Uh, he he certainly seems to 
uh, care more. You know, he's got he's got Robert's charm and charisma, but he seems like he's a little more dialed into actually what it would take to rule. Um, yeah, maybe not. Maybe he'd just been lazy like Robert for all we know. But I but I agree with you. He seemed at least like he was a more likely to to be more conscientious mm-hmm. as a ruler. Uh, Joe, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely one of the people that have flip-flopped on him, and I was just kind of indifferent before. Uh, I'm not a fan as much after this reread. I, but let's say he was on the throne. Um, I think, ironically, he would do all the right things, but he would actually still probably be a bad person doing them. If we were reading, like, Fire and Blood Volume 8, set 200 years after the series, <laughs> you would probably, like, it would all of the stuff he did would probably be fine, but if you actually knew him, um, mm. it probably would not. And I do think um, if he was on the throne when the others actually came and that all actually became real, I do not mm. think he would handle that very well at all. Fair <laughs> point. Since you brought up Fire and Blood, maybe Renly is like Viserys the First. I mean, he's ah. just kind of, he loves parties and looking good and stuff, but uh, Wants he to be loved. like to mm. kind of turn a blind eye to the bad stuff. So I could I see know. that, yeah. Because he knows how to be imperious, but he might be imperious about the wrong things. Like, he's definitely authoritative, mm-hmm. but he's not necessarily authoritative about the right things. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I agree with that. Good takes, y'all. All right, let's take a little quick mid-roll break and uh, get a, do a couple shout-outs, and then we'll come back with the rest of the characters, starting with John. Okay, so uh, every... Every episode where we have Patreon shoutouts, we do certain uh, versions of them during the mid roll. This time, uh, as is typical, we shout out our Blood Rider patrons. That includes Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian Steel Arak with a Dragonbone Hilt, Kohal Chloe, called Sun Piercer, wielder of a Dragonbone Bow, and Kokavo the Tamer, wielder of the Wildfire Whip Gehenna. Also, shout outs to our Queens of Love and Beauty. From the depths of Flea Bottom, Lord Kerry. Oops, <laughs> Lord Ken. I've done that so many times. I, I need to get I need to get new glasses or something that I can see my screen better. Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for. What's that? I can't wear glasses during episodes. You're right. The glare is really bad. I need to wear a contact or something, or or just turn this this resolution up. <laughs> Lord Ken has been Lord Carey so many times. Well, it's Queen Carey. That's why it's in my head that way, too. Lord Ken of House Hammer has declared for Queen Carey, fire of the North, who recovered Dark Sister from beyond the wall. And a laurel of glory in the name of love to Bud of House Beresford, a knight of Tokian, an arbiter of Scotch, from Sandy the Dragon, blood of Queen Daenerys, and Lady of Jameson. Also, a shout out to our Ironborn captains, starting with... Well, I have to find them first. Where are the... These Ironborn captains are so sneaky. Black Matos Stormrider, Captain of the Rusted Hinge. Sir Selvus Redblade of White Harbor, Captain of Trident of the North. Lord Chuck Laws, Captain of the Droman Nightblood, Destroyer of Evil. John Gregor, Captain of the Fist of the Drowned God. Sir Kiron of Lonely Light, Scourge of the Sunset Sea, Captain of Naga's Breath, a Droman armed with siphons of wildfire. Aileen, Archer Queen, Captain of the Border Collie. Crimson Kate, Captain of the Drowned Queen's Vengeance. Jasana the Just, Collector of Tolls, Captain of the Golden Gift. Lord Mitch of House Bailey is Captain of Widow's Blood. His heir is Lordling Mason of House Bailey. Beneath the Gold, a podcast focusing on the lesser known A Song of Ice and Fire characters. Check it out. Prakash, the Lord Protector of the Gallifreyans, Captain of Tardis of the Seven Seas. And Tempest of House Brewer, Captain of the Summer Storm. Also want to introduce you all to the Pot Moms podcast. It is a weekly pot-themed podcast that talks about cannabis and parenting. The Pot Moms podcast exists to help debunk the myth that moms and dads who smoke pot are bad parents. They aren't. They're really, really good ones. They review products and strains. They interview interesting people, and they join people who support or would like to learn more about cannabis and the great community around it. Hopefully, they'll make you laugh, too. And honestly, maybe it's just worth a listen so you can hear their dope theme song. I appreciate that pun. Join Kate and Paul on their weekly show, available on almost all of your favorite streaming platforms, and destigmatize and learn cool shit. Keep blazing and stay amazing. I hope that's what they say at the end of every episode or beginning of every episode, because that's cool. <laughs> keep blazing and stay amazing. I might steal that. <laughs> yeah, Pot Moms Podcast. Yep, yep. Uh-huh. I, I imagine several people perked up at that. Like, what? There's a what now? <laughs> uh, so, 
finish this episode first, then go check them out. But yeah, do check them out. Okay, so um, let's get into John and then move on to Davos and or Theon, then Davos, then Danny, then Tyrion. Uh, but first, a, a quick question for y'all out there, both for my guests and for you guys listening, whether you're listening live or listening after the fact. The Tyrion, of course, has the longest arc in this book. It's that's pretty apparent given he has by far the most chapters and most audiobook length. Arya is second most. Um, but who is next longest, Cat or John? I'll. Uh, do you guys know off the top of your head? It's close. <clears throat> I would say John. Um, I was. I went as far as looking up their number of chapters, which I think are equal. Yeah, they both have. I, I think they both have eight. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I, I'm just guessing now. So I think it's Cat. It is Cat. I think it, and it, I think the reason is is what we talked about before is that she's she's more she does more witnessing. John has yeah. spent so much time mm-hmm. beyond the wall, just in action, and a, action tends to be a little briefer. But it's close. And then after that, um, I'll ask one more of those. Who has who's next longest? Theon, Sansa, or Bran? Oh boy. Mm. Difficult. It difficult. Is, it is difficult. Uh, I was going to say Bran, but he has that really big gap while he's hiding. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking Sansa because it's through her eyes that we see so much of the Blackwater action. I'll say Fionn then. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the answer is I'm double checking my math to make sure I got it right. The answer is Theon. That's right. Theon is 217 minutes, Sansa 185, Bran 197. For reference, Catelyn was 254 and John was 237. Mm-hmm. And the and and Tyrion is four hundred and fifty five minutes, <laughs> whereas and oh, Arya is three hundred and sixteen. So yeah, whereas wow. Daenerys is only one sixty and Davos is one thirty seven. Of course, Davos. There's also the Crescent chapter, which is the longest chapter in all of Storms and all in the oh second longest chapter in the entire series, which is kind of a Davos ish chapter, sort of. It certainly contains the same characters. All right, well let's move on. Just a little fun trivia for y'all there. Let's talk about John whose chapters are not as long as cats, but <laughs> that is, it's not all about length, y'all. <laughs> that's what she said. That's what he said. That's what he said. She disagreed. She's like, nah, it's kind of about length. Uh, <laughs> so John set up for wildlings joining humans. He is a uh, 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 night's watchman joining the wildlings. And that is somewhat of a setup for the wildlings joining all of humanity, the rest of humanity uh, much later. And, of course, that same theme of identity is a big part of all of this, and it, which it is for a lot of characters, really. Um, he's becoming a warg. He's a, he's a bastard. He's later going to be a dead person, which we'll have to see how that goes. And as well as being a hidden king, which he doesn't know, and which most readers, you know, on their first read will have almost no clue of. But as people who have reread many times and have seen the show, keeping track of John with the idea that he is a hidden king is, is pretty fun. Um, this time we'll start with Lady Gwen. Um, what do you think uh, about John's arc here, about his transition to the Wildlings, and about mm. maintaining what his father taught him and things like that? Yeah, I mean, John. It's interesting because I find John's arc in in this book, uh, he definitely becomes more comfortable in his in his own skin early on, and then. Um, but then he's got a, this big change where he has to join the wildlings, which puts him kind of back on his heels again. So, I mean, it's like you said, you know, bastard, you know, these, these sort of ways that he is an outsider. Um, so he starts to feel a little bit less like an outsider and then he ends up being one all over again. Uh, but otherwise I kind of find his arc to be, of all the other things that are going on in the book, and this is definitely not any kind of, not any dismissal of John, this one is the least interesting to me out of the entire rest of the book. Hmm. Um, so I know, I know. It's got to be something. It's got to be something. It, it had to be something. <laughs> but I mean, I, I love the you know, if you think about Theon, and I already said how, you know, how much I love the Renly and Stannis stuff and, and all the Blackwater and Cat and all that. So we're left with kind of, well, um, John's chapters tend to be the ones that I'm like, okay, this is happening. (laughs) To me, his character gets a lot more interesting um, in the next book. So, Uh, If you couldn't hear, uh, Shea said, I agree. So Shea is... is... (laughs) 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, John. He's one of my favorite characters. It's just, you know, what can I say? Someone has to come in last place out of all the POVs, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> has to be someone. So, uh, Joe, what's your tech here? I'm guessing yeah, it's would... different because you're such a Corrin fan. So, <laughs> yeah, Corrin fan, yeah. It's his arc is kind of tailored two arcs for John in this book. There's the, the geo time on the ranging, and then he kind of has a little break on the fist of the first thing where he goes off of Ghost, and then it's Corrin time after that, and everything after that is is amazing. But I agree that the early on, especially right at the beginning, I think the first one or two John chapters are kind of um, yeah, not all there. And I think you said about the the prologue being one of the longest. One of the John ones has got to be in running with the the shortest, the one where they find the kind of half burnt weirwood. That's like, a, like four or five pages in the books. Really short. Yes, that is a short chapter. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just kind of a little bit bland early on. But like I say, after he gets with Corrin, it fits so much in. I really didn't remember how little. I think it might be three chapters that Corrin's in, and they fit. Yeah, there's loads. And you said at the beginning about um, a lot of this being about the wildlings and John's viewpoint of them. You can see, or I definitely saw a lot more of Lord Commander John in this book yeah. than I had on previous reads, because we're looking for him. Um, we know what policies he's going to end up with, and yeah, I, d I did find it interesting. I know uh, I've put you as easy through a lot because every week I turn in notes where I just bashing your Mormon again and again, and again <laughs> and same thing every chapter because he keeps making the same bad decision. So I won't repeat those uh, again. But John also does. Um, you're talking about witnesses. He becomes almost too much of a witness, I think, in those early um, when they when they get to Craster's and when they're just w looking around the villages. He's not really doing anything. He's just kind of there, and then he gets his his own agency a bit a back a bit um, when he decides to go off of Ghost, much like in um, in Storm when Ghost returns and he becomes more of himself again. Yeah, so, yeah. That's really well said. I'll, I'll add to that by saying that, in a sense, he's he's a little bit like Ned, um, which is great because he's supposed to be a lot like Ned. And it, and what I mean by that is that he doesn't really know what's going on around him. He's he's out there. He's being brave. He's got the right attitude, but he's kind of clueless to a lot of what's happening. He's naive about a lot of things. He doesn't understand the wildlings. He's like a grits teaching him all kinds of things. Corin's teaching him all kinds of things. Even Sam is teaching him things. And Sam was like having a better time. Uh, as we saw, Sam was adjusting better than John was in a lot of ways. And uh, so he doesn't understand. That's the problem. Is we, it's, it's a POV that doesn't grasp what's happening. Whereas Catelyn is also just as much a witness as John, But she understands what's happening and has like really insightful thoughts about it. Um, now, to be fair to John, what's happening around him is a lot of supernatural stuff that's really, really hard to understand. You're not meant to be clear on it. It's supposed to be mysterious and maybe never get real answers on. So... It, it, if if Catelyn or Ned were dealing with these kind of supernatural things, they probably wouldn't have such great insight either. But they would, you know, as adults with lots more experience, they would still probably handle it better than than young John does. But um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. And the the one other thing that jumped out to me is um, especially the where he is with Egret and he's deciding whether to behead her or not. It's the first kind of time he's actually challenging kind of Ned's lessons and seeing, uh, hang on, this doesn't actually work in every situation mm -hmm. i think that's spread against across all the stark children that their ned's lessons and sayings they're not theoretical anymore they're not as clear-cut because you did have in game of thrones like i was listening and they say about the when the cold winds blow and all that and that's all very well when you're sat in the tower of the hand with 50 guards walking around <laughs> and out and actually having to put that into practice and the same with sansa not so much brand not until the end he's fairly safe until theon comes along but you can see how uh, there's the transition between Ned Fury in, um, in Game of Thrones and now it's actually Ned Practicality and John's having to challenge that. That's a great point because if, and if we tie that to this, this central theme of, of John's arc, which is uniting the wildlings and the rest of humanity, well, it's one thing for your pack to be a pack when it's a family. That's already a challenge. I mean, especially even with the Starks, it's already a challenge to keep the pack together. But a ma but a pack that is the wildlings and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms, like trying to move, keep, stick together humanity versus the you know living versus the dead. That's a bigger challenge because there's just so much. I mean, you have m bigger differences to overcome. You have grievances. You have bloody vengeance. You have you know all these other things to deal with that isn't necessarily present in a regular family even a noble family it might be uh 
which is a good transition to Theon, a family that does have quite a bit of infighting and quite a bit of violence amongst its uh, members, especially Euron, who I love to see that there is a decent bit of setup, not specifically about Euron, but just Theon thinks about, boy, that guy is scary, you know, and other people, just the idea that this is a scary, scary villainous character. We don't know much about him yet, but the, that groundwork is there. And uh, we get lots of setup for Balon and Asha and Aaron. I really appreciate that even this early, uh, even though that George decided midstream to greatly expand the Ironborn plot, he clearly had plans for them from the get-go. And a lot of these central characters, uh, he, even though he expanded their roles, they still have the same personality that they started with. Balon, Asha, Aaron, even, even Victorian for the most part. And that's inter that's interesting as a meta commentary on because so much of Theon's arc is about identity. And a big new thing for me, like I said, when we were talking about which chapter stood out more this time around was noticing how much Ramsey's arc in this book is similar to Theon's arc. Trying to be what his dad or his family expects him to be, a Bolton doing the ultimate, taking out the Starks. Now, of course, a, a big reason why I might have not keyed in on this before is it's not 100% clear that Ramsay wasn't told by Roos to do this. It, this might have happened. I think it's, from a story perspective, it's more interesting if Ramsay did this on his own, but it's absolutely possible that Roos sent word home, hey, go, you know, do this. Uh, so that's part of my question, is I want, when you guys answer, uh, weigh in on Theon, I'd like you to weigh in on what you think, whether uh, that came, the orders came from Roos or whether Ramsey did it on his own. Uh, this time, um, we'll start with Lady Gwen. Okay. Uh, Theon's arc in this book is just so painful. <laughs> just, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in a good way. I mean, I just feel he, he is just a, a, a character in pain. I mean... He, he's going to be even more so by the next time we see him, which is <laughs> going to be, you know, almost three books from now, but uh, two and a half. But uh, boy, you know, I, I just I feel his his deep emotional pain right right from the very beginning. He tries to hide it like he always does with his bravado um, His, you know, he's that smiling guy uh, that everybody comments on and Game of Thrones. And of course, by the end of this book, uh, Smiler is burning. So that's kind of literally, you know, <laughs> That's not subtle, is it? That's not subtle at <laughs> <It's> all. <laughs> uh, but really just, I, I love his arc, even though I find it painful to read. I actually find this more painful than, um, than the Reek arc in, in, um, in Dance with Dragons for some reason. Uh, uh, maybe because his family is so horrible. I, I can't stand Balon. Yeah. Uh, He's, he's the only person <laughs> we've so ever bad. done a podcast about that we didn't really find anything good to say about him. <laughs> <laughs> he was brave? I mean, I guess that's something. Bail on the yeah. brave yeah, but sort of good, neutral good, I yeah, guess. Yeah, he used but, his bravery yeah. for bad things. So. <laughs> yeah. Jeez. <So. laughs> All right, Joe, uh, let's hear from you then on this. Yeah, it, it's obviously a, a sad, uh, kind of devastating plot line, I think. Because we know it, well, we know where it goes. And even, like you say, even in this book, it goes pretty bad by the end. So I almost have to look at, I have to laugh through this um, arc because it's it's so bad. I almost have to, arc, especially obviously that chapter with Esgred as well, um, which we'll talk about <laughs> later. But all the way through that chapter, when he gets to Winterfell, Wex the whole way through is just the funniest guy on Riri because you know what he knows. Um, even right up to the end where Lewin is. Um, talking about him going to the night's watch which is a really intriguing proposition but he's already within two minutes being like yeah i could be law commander that'd be easy and just step into it because he, <laughs> he because he's theon and uh we, we find out he doesn't actually learn anything at all through this whole book even by the end he's still kind of the same idiot but you can't really blame him because like you say balon he, balon kind of strikes me as like a really really lazy joffrey where he if he could be bothered <laughs> he would crossbow people and stuff as well but he can't be doing that so he'll just declare war whenever he likes mm. I, th I think this is, this arc has a bit or definitely it came out to me this time it's a, you know, they say part of grown up is realizing like adults don't know what they're doing and Balon especially has just has no idea what he's doing he's never this whole plan is not well thought out he's got no um, backup or contingencies or anything 
So he really stands out to me. But I think probably my favorite thing about Fear on this on this reread is is Asha because hmm. on a if just blanket you can see okay yeah she's funny she's quite good at getting a rise out of him. But when you actually look at it, you can see how much setup there is for her being really politically savvy and um, being able to get information out of Fionn, being able to read Fionn, because he could have easily come back and been like Victoria number two and just beat her to death because he, she embarrassed him or whatever like that. She doesn't know. She doesn't know what he's turned into. And um, yeah, you can see the following she's got already. You can see how smart she is to just, she knows that Balon's plan is rubbish. So she's kind of looking after herself. Mm -hmm. So if anything, yeah, I'm really glad that we get all that and uh, George decided to continue with it and use it later mm -hmm. on because obviously she could have just fallen into the back burner, I guess. Yeah. You also see how much she actually loves her brother. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And they, by yeah. the end, so. Yeah, yeah. she mocks she him, great. she teases him, but she doesn't, she ultimately, like her advice for him is ultimately good advice. And yeah, yeah you can tell she's not ruthless. She's not like, oh, well you know if i want to be queen this guy's got to die <laughs> no she's she's got more uh ethics and and goodness in mm -hmm. her than that which is why she's the best of the ironborn i suppose it's not a, that's not a tough call for most of us i think <laughs> no yes it is definitely um oh so we didn't talk about ramsey i'm sorry oh yeah go for it uh, yeah, forget go, about that, that. Mm. so um yeah i'm i just yes i think that uh Roos was planning his whole uh ruse business way earlier than it's uh, than is obvious we've talked about this in in our episodes in the past so yeah i think that uh, ramsey was put up to it maybe not uh directly but at least obliquely by his father uh, so right on well, yeah. and joe yeah, I'd have to agree. It's, it's really the whole uh, Reek Ramsey thing and the whole Roos Ramsey thing. It's really hard to get on a first read. I definitely didn't get it. And even now I'm still seeing things like, oh, yeah, he's actually like saying that this early on, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And each chapter I was flipped off in between them. But ultimately, yeah, I end up on the same boat that Roos. Uh, I don't think he left the specific. I especially don't think he told him to like destroy Winterfell because Roos knows how useful that could be down the mm, road yes. um, if everything goes well. Yeah. Um, but he definitely, um, yeah, gave him the push, I guess. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it's a case of Roos not realizing yet what he's got in Ramsey or if he's just not paying attention to detail, but that doesn't sound very Roos-like. So um, whether that's some, something lost in communication between the two, you definitely see Roos's uh, fingerprints on it by the end. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> certainly Roos, uh, certainly gets on board with the plan whether he wasn't on board with the beginning one one piece of evidence that ramsey was was acting somewhat independently if not entirely independently is is his plan with the miller's boys like that that could not have been real no, yeah uh, clearly no. right. and so this whole like oh let's make sure that, that these stark boys everyone thinks they're dead <laughs> which is key to absconding with winterfell having those starks around to claim it that's almost certainly just pure Ramsey. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that, that's certainly an argument for Ramsey being the one. And we may find out, you know, obviously Roos and Ramsey are both still alive. We may get more uh, from them on uh, how this all played out. Okay, before we do Davos, let's talk, uh, let's take a segue to talk about some of our favorite actual chapters. Um, I asked both of my guests here to think about that ahead of time. So they have some prepared answers. Uh, this time, we will start with Joe. This is kind of fitting. You're, the first one I see you wrote here is uh, in line with what we were just talking about. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to go into Fion 2 much because we were coming to this bit. Uh, like I mentioned, Fion 2, the um, the one with Esgred slash Asher and that whole uncomfortable ride back up to Pike. Um, for the purposes specifically of rereading, I don't. I honestly don't think there's a whole chapter in the in the whole series that <laughs> that changes as much as first time because obviously first time re readers have no idea and uh, there's no <laughs> clues there. But second time and every time after that, it is it's still absolutely hilarious. I literally laugh while I'm reading it, um, <laughs> and it and it just sets the table for Theon being an idiot <laughs> the whole the whole book. And and like I say um, about Asher being. And not only smart and, and cunning but brave um and yeah I, I just i have to pick that what i take a special time to read that every time it comes across um other than that uh catlin four which is the one um where renly dies at the end it begins with catlin and the sept it's a really cool passage about um 
Catelyn and her, how the faith works with her and her looking, she sees the different people. She sees Aya as the warrior, which she wouldn't have thought of Catelyn beforehand based on her Game of Thrones stuff, stuff like that. It's a really beautiful written chapter. It starts out all colourless and then after Renly's death, all the colour comes back just this everything falls into chaos. And I think my favourite bit has always been that Brienne, throughout the whole conversation that Catelyn's having with Renly, which is another one of those... Uh, kind of missed moments where Catelyn is almost getting Renly to kind of agree to something and then it doesn't actually work out. Mm-hmm. But the whole way through, Brienne, Brienne is really meticulously and carefully putting on all his armour and protecting him. And then at the end, obviously, the, the shadow baby comes in and none of it matters and he just dies anyway. So uh, <laughs> that and any Corrin chapter. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> well said. Those are good choices. Uh, Lady Gwen, your turn. Well, I have some different ones. We got... Um, for sheer beauty and atmospheric writing, uh, Cat 2, which is her ride into uh, the Reach, as she's uh, arriving at Bitterbridge. And oh, is that the seven. descriptions of the of the morning and the dawn and all that? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. So she that starts is beautiful, with her yeah. dreaming, and then she wakes up, and that whole morning, dawn, and then arriving at Bitterbridge and seeing Renly's army and all of that. And uh, Bran 7, which is their departure from Winterfell, which starts with him inside of summer and seeing the ash and the air and the, the burned castle. Uh, so those just for the sheer writing, but beyond that, it's <clears throat> for me, it's all about sequences. Um, you got those six Blackwater chapters, Oh yeah. Uh, boom, 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 which are the best descriptions of war or battle in, in the entire series. Um, and the fact that we get so much of the high level and behind the scenes information from the eyes of a young girl uh, is I think just makes it so much better because uh, it's really a unique way to see war. Uh, and then you get that, that sequence um, that um, comes right before Blackwater. I, I can't get enough of this. Uh, I, I talk about this a lot. It's uh, when the reveal that Bran and Rickon aren't dead. Uh, it's just that classic George three-part reveal uh, where you got these chapters positioned, which is why I think it's so important to read periodically, read everything in order the way he wrote it. Uh, you get uh, in Theon 4, Theon says they're dead. And then you get two John chapters, John 6 and John 7, where you get the story of Bale the Bard, uh, where, you know, uh, they, it's, Egret says they had been in Winterfell all the time, hiding with the dead beneath the castle. And then in the next <laughs> chapter, he dreams about Bran and uh, he's smelling death. He knows he's, he's smelling something. He realizes it's death. And uh, Bran says to him, don't be afraid. I like it in the dark. Then it goes back to Theon, who dreams about the dead, including the Miller's wife. And then you get the reveal. So it's just that three part, like, here's a little hint. Here's a bigger hint. I'm going to clobber you over the head with it. And there's the, so that's the way uh, his editor has described the way he reveals things. And this to me is the classic example of, of that three part reveal. So uh, even better in that sequence, uh, you get in between all those hints and that, you know, that reveal, you get the news spreading that Bran and Rickon are dead. And I uh, love the part where Tyrion warns Cersei that this, development could endanger Jamie. They might decide to kill him. And then <laughs> the next time you see a River Run chapter, it's Cat. It's in it's in between in the middle of that sequence. And it's Cat freeing Jamie. Although we don't know that at the time. But yeah. <laughs> Just, <laughs> she's she's got the sword. Uh so you're kind of left uh if this is your first read, you're left wondering, oh my God, was Tyrion, right? Uh, Just such great writing in yeah. that whole sequence. That, um, nice. Wow. Good so choices, in other words, yeah. I think I picked like half the book. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny you picked like you said John was some of the least interesting, but you picked some of like a t- couple of John chapters there. And anyway, it's like yeah, yeah even that's like even though that's yeah. how it works. Even the least interesting is still really mm-hmm. interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have their moments. Um, mm-hmm. For me, uh, I would I'll, I'll start off by echoing John Seven. That's a big one for me, especially this time around. Just looking at the peculiarities of, of that dream and why Bran mm-hmm. forgets it, and something just very it strikes me as odd about that. It, it, it gets me all into the rabbit hole of what's going on with the supernatural. Um, I also particularly like 
it's not as uh, it's it's not one of the more highly regarded chapters, but I like some of John's early arc going to White Tree and just getting into what the heck is going on with those sacrifices and all that. But in terms of in terms of um, other characters, I really really love uh, some of the same stuff that you mentioned, uh, Lady Gwyn. But from the other side, I like Davos. Is I'll mention it since you didn't Davos two, where uh, he is. It has a lot. It's it's the chapter that has. The meeting with Courtney Penrose, and Courtney Penrose mm. is a fantastic short-term character, and you get this beautiful setting of Davos being the fish out of water, having uh, feeling a little out of place with all these lords who are much, you know, he thinks about how they're all dressed and they're all glittering, and but Stannis, you know, being such an amazingly gray character he's doing all this kind of dark evil supernatural stuff and and not taking responsibility for it but he treats davos the way everyone we we all yearn to see people treated the way stannis treats davos you know like you want (laughs) we want all our leaders to treat their subordinates you know sort of like this at least at least to respect them in this way to listen to them to put in a in a realm where nobility counts for correctness which it never should like nobility if you're if you're noble it means you're more likely to be right which what that's not how it works that's not that's not true but it is how they behave like if you are a noble person's word versus a commoner's word the noble or the noble person's word is going to be taken over the commoners almost every time no matter how plain the facts are and that just stinks about medieval society or ancient society or where these the power structures are so the the difference in power between the highest members of society and the lowest is so vast that that alone substitutes for uh, being correct. And so seeing Stannis do that is so very refreshing. But at the same time, you have him, while he's being good, you also see him doing all these kind of dirty, evil things like, I don't know about doing this, Stannis. So it's really wonderfully placed, the dichotomy of Stannis being good and evil at the same time. And Davos struggling with that he sees a lot of this 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 darkness but he's pledged to follow stannis and i love seeing davos struggle with that his conflict is really interesting also i i I love pointing to uh you guys pointed this somewhat already the theon uh aspects are surprisingly strong even after having read them so many times and i guess maybe joe you mentioned theon too i think that might be one of the ones i would mention as well but also uh, Theon Five, which is the one where he has the dreams, the most intense mm-hmm. dreams, and those are really interesting too because you, you wonder. It's kind of like Jamie's dream, uh, where he rests his head on the weirwood stump and has this great dream about Brienne and all these other things. But it's not just the weirwood stump; he's also just been given dream wine, and he's also feverish, so he's hallucinating. So there's multiple reasons for his dream to be that way, and it's the same for Theon. He's sleeping in a weirwood bed. It's Ned's bed. And it's in Winterfell, but he also has all these emotions that would, you know, that give. There's plenty of reason for him to have nightmares and and, and horrible dreams. So it's a good, good, like so, like Lady Gwyn says, there's George's way of doing reveals is kind of a classic and uh, has a. It's, it's complicated in its own way, but it's also something you could recognize. He does the same thing with these uh, mixed conflict where you you don't really know which way is up necessarily and the character you're struggling along with the character as they're struggling to figure out what's right and wrong so are you and i love how he does that all right so speaking of um let's talk about davos a character who is thrust right in the middle of that he like a lot of characters has a bookend to his arc in a sense he starts off his the first thing you see him doing if you're if you don't count crescent uh, the first thing you see him doing from his own pov is watching the gods burn and then at the end of the book, he's literally in a burning bay, uh, trying to stay alive and, and, and in danger of being burned himself. And in both cases, his sons are there. His sons are with him to watch the burning gods, and his sons are with him uh, dying on the Blackwater, burning again. So he's got a little, a little bit of an ironborn aspect to him, being a sailor and rising again harder and stronger. And uh, looking at Stannis this time around is interesting, knowing what we know. And, of course, there's a lot of supernatural going around on Davos that he is not part of, but he is directly observing um, some things that are not clearly, not as clearly supernatural, like Patch Face, or at least not clear what it means. And then Melisandre, very blatantly supernatural and just getting started in this book. I mean, she's not even at the Battle of Blackwater. So, all right, Joe, you can go. Let's have you go first this time. 
Um, you, I see you wrote some good notes here, and I would love you to hear your thoughts on these topics that I just laid out. Yeah, I think the, to start the supernatural stuff at the beginning, it's all, um, like you say, he's observing it, he's absorbing it, um, and but not he wasn't really getting involved too much until all of a sudden before he knows it, he's in the boat with uh, Melisandre and he's, he's really involved in the supernatural stuff. And he probably thinks that's the worst it's going to get. And uh, little does he know he's going to just be dragged back in time and time again, come uh, storm of swords in terms of Melisandre. He's not really going to get away from that again. Um, and probably considering where he is at the end of uh, dance of dragons, he may well again with the other side of the uh, magical cell and the ice side. But um, in terms of his arc, I think this is George really, really showing off. It amazes me that he fits this much into three. Davos should not just have three chapters when you. It doesn't think, think like um, yeah. It doesn't feel like yeah, he only has three, ridiculous. but he only has three. Yeah. <laughs> when you look at it, all that uh, he gets done, I know he does have like quite big chapters. I think Davos one is it's like he, when he starts off watching the ceremony and he goes to talk to Salador and then he's back to Stannis and then uh, he gets it all done in a day. It's very similar to Tyrion's chapters in that they're both hands uh, or they will be. Um, but yeah, for people who, who try and write stuff to see George fit that amount of uh, not only information in him doing stuff, but the amount of characterization in just three chapters and especially considering the third one is him in a battle there's not a lot of time to get character across but i also think this is really just good timing to include davos as a pov even if obviously he's got to be there to so we can see stannis but even if crescent didn't die and we had crescent throughout this book i think it's still important to get davos in now because we've just seen what evil social mobility looks like in game of thrones in terms of uh, peter baelish and uh, all how far he's come. So now we want to see the other side of the coin and see what good uh, social ability and see how far Davos has risen. And obviously he's going to go higher in the next book, but that also plays really well alongside Aya revealing the plight of the small folk because Davos is our one kind of small folk based uh, POV, even though he doesn't actually spend all that much time with them. This is pretty much as close as he gets. And then he's just with uh, nobles from here on out. But I think that he just goes really well with the bread riots and um, all that stuff happening from where he came from in Flea Bottom, and then him rounding it out, like you say, in a battle with hundreds and thousands of others of other small folk who've kind of just got caught up in the exact same battle and war that he has. He's just been able to go a few steps higher than them. Hmm. Yeah, well said, mm. Lady Gwen. You're, uh, let's hear from you. I think you know Davos. I like what you said, Joe, about him being closest you get to small folk. He's he is the every man of mm. our of yeah. our POVs in the entire series. You know, he he is just a normal guy, and um, so having his perspective on all of this, especially on the supernatural stuff, which starts really uh, in the Crescent Prologue, because you see he him see Crescent put the poison in the wine. Uh, and then Crescent dies, but Melisandre doesn't. So right away, uh, before he even gets the point of view, you know that this guy is going to be in opposition to Melisandre. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then him just kind of watching her whole <laughs> her whole thing develop, uh, <laughs> it's getting it's setting up where he's going to be at in the next book, right? Because in the next book, it's he's going to be all about. Uh, trying to kill her or bring her down um, just up to that point when finally realizes that they have, they have a, a bigger things to worry about. Yeah. Uh, she wasn't, she's not so wrong after all, even though she's like, uh, sacrificing leech bloody woman that she is, you know? <laughs> yeah. But fortunately, I mean, sort of ironically, this is looking ahead a little bit that that realization is what is actually going to get him, out of her out of her sort of orbit if you will you know because finally in a dance with dragons he gets to go off on another uh secret mission uh for stannis which is where he starts in this book he's just come back from his secret mission that's you know, right in the game mm. of thrones nobody mm. really knew what stannis was up to it was like you know he's over there he's doing stuff but it's all very <laughs> vague and he's nobody could quite predict what he was planning and then come to find out it was uh that he had entrusted davos with this uh with this mission uh around to all the stormlords and 
uh, that says a lot about his character right yeah, off the bat. That's true. I just want to add that it's um, when I was doing some research for this episode, uh, I, f I discovered another piece of book ending that fits here better than anywhere else, I suppose, which is that the first character to die in the book is Cresson. The last character to die in the book is Lewin. So you have a maester mm. starting and ending the death cycle mm -hmm. in the book uh, here. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, maybe intentional choice by George. Maybe it just kind of worked out that way. But uh, it's a good chance it was intentional. And that's uh, maybe there's something about the death of, of reason, the death of uh, knowledge, the death of um, uh, things like of, of educated takes, things like that, which uh, is, is fitting for a, a country thrown into war. Okay, let's move on to Danny. Danny uh, has a much shorter arc, whereas Arya goes from five chapters to ten. Danny goes from ten chapters to five. And it's sort of a, uh, I don't know, it's a transition point for her. There's still a lot of interesting things that happen. I, I would have, I should have mentioned, actually, one of my favorite chapters is The House of the Undying because it's very interesting to take a second look at it with the knowledge of what happens in the TV show. For example, John Fitz much better than he, he he was a candidate for a lot of those bits in the house of the undying before and after seeing the show it's it's like she, he fits them really well it's like oh this mm -hmm. kind of nails this kind of settles this issue for a lot of them uh so i i think that's pretty important themes of her being a savior and dest having a destiny are huge obviously she's she's got jesus themes going on with the comet and the the three wise men and the desert and all that and then so many supernatural things line up for her to, to indicate that she is indeed a child of destiny. It's hard for her to, to see it any other way. And then Karth itself represents long-term, uh, a city that's had a really long-term existence and what happens when, when that, in, in such a scenario, it becomes extremely corrupt. Corruption becomes ritualized. Things that are really dark are quite normal there. And of course... Her arc is also dramatically different in how much, how bloody it is. Uh, in A Game of Thrones, her arc is very, very bloody. In A Storm of Swords, it's very, very bloody. In A, in a Clash of Kings, not so much. Not so much at all. There's very mm -hmm. little death. There's no war. Um, there isn't all this, all these people being abused and raped. It's very, very different. But uh, So that is notable in and of itself. So let's get takes from y'all. Uh, Lady Gwen, we'll start with you this time. What do you think about Danny? Well, other than, you know, I, I agree with you. I really love the uh, House of the Undying. And it, there were some some small moments of, you know, symbolism and seeing her uh, her arc develop along certain paths, like the savior, uh, the savior imagery. Uh, Danny is really a character in stasis throughout this book. And for the most part, she... she she gets to Karth. She doesn't do too much. Uh, but the end, for me, uh, the end of her arc is the most interesting part of it, where she gets on board those three ships named after the Conqueror's dragons and, yeah. and sets sail westward. I mean, she doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. Obviously, things go a little bit differently than she or we may have thought. Uh, but in, you know... Uh, the implication at the end of this book is it has been set up that she has, is a savior with this destiny. And now she's got these three ships carrying her symbolically uh, towards Westeros. So uh, it's quite a thrilling ending. And, um, you know, uh, on a reread, just, just as much so, because now we get to know that our stand is Aristan. Yeah. And that's big, <laughs> a big deal. Do you think, which side of the, of the theory are you on with Barristan? Or do you think he'll turn on Danny or no? Or do you maybe have a third take on uh, something entirely different? Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's possible. Uh, if she, if he witnesses her, you know, doing something, let's say he survives, you know, the, the battle of fire and witnesses, something from her that's unacceptable. I don't think that he will stand uh, and turn a blind eye again. I think okay. he's reached a point in his life where he realizes that he 
how wrong he was you know he's tormented by the fact that he saved Ares from Duskendale you know he thinks that his moment of glory was probably his lowest moment as you know probably as a human being yeah and um I so I don't think he'll stand by I don't think he'll be a bystander again right on. so if she starts doing Ares like things I don't think he'll be sticking around <laughs> and whether or not he turns or not it's very interesting to reread with an eye towards that which I had not done mm-hmm. before none of my previous reads was I consider even considering the possibility that Barrison would turn. So getting to look look for all the clues from the beginning this time is fun. Joe, what do you think? Uh, well, for that specific question, I think I think it's going to be a case of George uh, kind of cackling and kind of twirling his mustache, and that <laughs> I, I think he's going to make him kind of repay his old mistakes, but in uh, in overkill, where he's going to make a mistake and like, here Daenerys has done something or. A, you know get the wrong end of the stick somehow and he's going to betray her and make up for his he's going to do the right thing the one time he shouldn't is what i'm getting at is uh, the one time it's not actually needed um where he could have just been kind of stood pat he's not going to to make up for those old times um in terms of daenerys's arc um it's probably one of the stickier points for the of the book to me but although just while i was listening to lady gwen there i was thinking about what parts it is i actually like and it's not that many i really like the first mm-hmm. chapter i really like the last chapter i really like the house the undying i think it's generally just calf and uh, especially zaro his way of talking and it, the just kind of creepy lechery kind of talking it's almost <laughs> as if he, it's a more chatty little finger in a way um it just rubs me up the wrong way so much and there's a lot of good stuff in there the savior stuff and the kind of um profit comparisons but her early chapters i don't get on very well with and the house of undying while i love it as a chapter if it still frustrates me so just purely because we haven't got a resolution for almost <laughs> any of it um, and she's kind of forgetting parts and this, she's starting to mix them in the head and i really do think um a lot of people disagree with me in this but i really do think there's an element of the unreliable narrator and what she saw mm. and i don't know she what she thinks she saw is what she saw and all that kind of stuff but i need to know and that's what that's what's getting to me it's not that it's, <laughs> any part of it's bad it's, it's so good that it's annoying me i don't uh, know anything more about it yet it's definitely but, gonna be yeah. one that has to look, be looked at again once the law oh, yeah. resolved see how we'll have to can re- you imagine yeah mm-hmm. but that's a uh, that's getting ahead of ourselves <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so let's move on um let's talk about Tyrion. that is our last arc and it's the longest one Starts and ends in King's Landing. There's a lot of reason to compare it to Ned. It's the same number of chapters. They have the same role, at least titular role as Hand of the King. And they're dealing with a lot of the same similar issues. But they deal with them in much different ways. Uh, Even though they're dealing with some of the same people. Like a a major uh, antagonist for both of them. Cersei, right? That's a very uh, similar thing. But it's a very different type of conflict. One is a familial conflict. One is more of a... They're, they're, they're both power struggles in a sense. But there's uh, a lot more history between Cersei and Tyrion. A lot more backstory between them. A lot more personal stuff. And of course, they both are living under the shadow of Tywin. Who has impacted both of them hugely. And that's something this arc really reveals quite a bit. You get the sense that in the, in the Game of Thrones that Tywin is not a good person, but you don't realize just how much of a hypocrite he is until this <laughs> book. And just the fact that he makes such a big deal about his son being captured in public, but then how he actually treats Tyrion in private, these are so misaligned. The hypocrisy is really over the top. It's really, really easy to hate Tywin, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about Tyrion's arc. But of course, a bigger part of Tyrion's arc, just or maybe just as big, is this slow burn of Shay and how that s- turns into his thoughts on Tysha and how these two things interact really darkly but really wonderfully in terms of the writing is really good. And there's a lot of little details in the, and nuance to Shay and Tyrion that... Uh, I'll bring up some of it afterwards after you guys have weighed in. We've got a couple of questions that are related to it. But just if you guys want to weigh in on on Taisha and Shay as well, that'll provide us with some groundwork for these uh, other questions we'll get to. So this time, Joe, we'll start with you. And uh, yeah, I was actually... I was actually going to focus in on the the Shay Taisha stuff. Perfect. Uh, the, the, there's a lot to um, there's a lot to go through in Tyrion, but I'll try and keep it focused. So that's the bit that really 
jumped out to me is if you'd asked me before, hey, hey, Jay, when does the Taisha stuff start coming into Tyrion's arc? I would have said Storm of Swords, but it's really not. It is this book, and especially uh, the Fairview go. When my first read that his constant hookups with Shay were kind of the boring bits to me, I didn't. I want to know about his battle preparations and the stuff with Cersei. I don't want to talk about uh, all the Shay stuff, but this time round. The comparisons to Taisha, especially with Shatea being captured and his kind of guilt on basically the exact same scenario replying of his of someone he loves getting captured and being handed over to a Lannister that hates him. Um, yeah, the, the Taisha, it knocked me to the floor, really does, of how much it, it's affecting him. And he just has no idea. Or rather, he does, but he just doesn't want to want to face up to it. So yeah. I think that's what um, stuck up to me that most of this time. He, he has the song start playing in his head before yeah, we know man. what that <laughs> song is, before we yeah. know that it's associated with Taisha. So that's another one of those mm. riddle before the answer before the riddle. Yeah. Mm. So that's really well done. Yeah. So that's that it probably explains what your perspective there, Joe, why you didn't realize. Because it's not clear that some of those things are Taisha related until a, a reread or multiple rereads. Uh, Lady Gwen, what do you think? Uh, well, just a minor little observation in terms of the Taisha thing. It's his last thoughts in the book are literally of Taisha. Like yeah. The last line in his, in his final chapter is about her. So it's just obvious that he's been building up towards that. Uh, in general, his arc, I mean, you know, all the comparisons to Ned, I, I mean, he's, he, does, even though he's much more of a great character, he seems to do everything so much better, and he's succeeding in places where Ned failed, obviously, in, in playing the game and dealing with some of these characters. Uh, but I really, I like your observation that he's kind of, that in the end, like Rob, he wins the battle and loses the war. It's, uh, you know, that's yeah. more of a political thing, but it's it's so true. Um, and as far as Tywin, going back to what you mentioned earlier, uh, I want to point out something that I've talked about before on our um, analysis of this. Tywin had his army ready, and, and he was on a war footing long before Tyrion was captured. So that <laughs> hypocrisy is so blatant, and I'm sure was so obvious to Tyrion himself. I mean, as much as as much as anyone else, um, that Tywin was basically sitting in the Riverlands with an army and all of a sudden he was like, oh, great, I've got an excuse. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, Thank you, agree. Catelyn Stark. You know, <laughs> but it, it would have been war with, uh, without, with or without Tyrion being captured. So it, the, the hypocrisy of him using his son like that is... Um, Pretty despicable. It's one of the things that makes us hate Tywin even more. Yep. And A Storm of Swords <laughs> is full of more of that. <laughs> There's yeah. a lot more. Tywin has his most screen time in A Storm of Swords as he's right there with uh, Tyrion preparing weddings, writing letters to Walder Frey, and doing all these other things that, yeah, giving swords out, uh, arguing with his father, telling him, telling Tyrion, you're not my son. You know, all these great things we mm -hmm. have to look forward to in the yeah. next book. So, Just yeah. ramping it up. It's a really big deal. So, quick, um, we are running a little short of time, but I have a couple of quick questions. If, if Lady Gwen, if you have to go early, we can, hand, we can take some of these other questions after you go. But if you can hang on, then we'll just keep going. I can hang on for a few more minutes. Cool. Let's do that then. Yeah. From Laura, yeah. Laura Brandos wants to know, I've already answered this question, um, but Laura Brandos wants to know, Lady Gwen and Joe, who gave the order to Mandon Moore? Lady Gwen, you go first. <laughs> well, um, Littlefinger. You think Littlefinger? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> right on. Um, Joe, and do you think Littlefinger, Cersei, Joffrey, or maybe someone else entirely? I was all Littlefinger before the last couple of chapters, and now I'm kind of leaning back towards Cersei, but I really <laughs> don't have any idea. So I could be Littlefinger again next week for all I know. I'll, <laughs> I'll throw in a third option that I hadn't really considered, and it fits in with our book ending uh, theme here, which is that Tyrion starts the book facing down Mandon Moore, who won't let him into the council chambers. And he asked, he's like, mm -hmm. okay, here's my first test of authority. If I let him hold me back, mm -hmm. then what does that say about my authority? But I can't just have him killed. That What does that say about my authority? So he has to play this central course. And that's what he has to do the whole book. He has to play this kind of tiptoe between Cersei and the war and all these other things. Uh, mm -hmm, so that, mm -hmm. that really, and then by the end, of course, he's 
Mandon tries to kill him. So it's <laughs> so my my little theory might is that maybe Mandon just did this on his own because he yeah. was uh, man he hated Tyrion for doing that and mm-hmm. uh, for shaming him and he's just like hey I got a chance to kill this guy and I'm gonna take it yeah um just because he's a and and Jamie did say he's the most dangerous because you can't you can't tell what he'll do next mm-hmm. uh so yeah there's a chance anyway okay so a few other questions here. Um, a super chat from Maura Lee saying with a, a gif of a, of a pear or an apple saying you are amazing. Well, thank you, Maura. We appreciate that. You are amazing too. Uh, Paul Barry, uh, with a take about Tyrion 13, he says, did you notice Tyrion's attempt to rouse the city watch is very close to the opposite perspective of Septon Maribald's broken man monologue from Feast. We only hear lords calling on their men to form up three times in the series so far. And the broken Mon monologue here in Tyrion's chapter and in a very different context when Asha and her gang escapes Deepwood Mott. It's tempting to see the watch, uh, the Watchmen and Sellswords as Craven in this case because we like Tyrion, but really like the Hound, they're just as scared. And George is, and, he's, and she, Paul says, George is really clever with this stuff. That's a great take. I never thought about it that way. I never thought about no. rallying the men as a topic. Certainly thought about the plight of the common man and how they're dragged into war. And Septon Maribald is a big part of that. But the idea, but thinking about them in this moment, uh, comparing them to Hound. If, if the Hound is scared, then damn, what <laughs> what must they be thinking? Uh, hmm. Any thoughts on that, uh, Lady Gwen? I just think that's a that's an interesting perspective because I never thought about it that way. Uh, this this as far as the speeches go, or even just as far as comparing different you know instances of this thing. So one one thing that that is uh, a subtle nuance to this take is that we we learn that a lot of the city watchmen are only city watch because they 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 realized they were starving men who could get a mm-hmm. meal by joining mm-hmm. and so they weren't ever really they were only ever joining out of into out of desperation in the first place and this is part yeah. of why the warnings about well you can't count on these city watchmen to to st- to man the walls if things go bad because they're not really <laughs> a lot of them were only hungry people uh okay so um joe let's hear from you on that one yeah, I think you can apply that. It's a great take, and you can apply it to the whole book. The kind of the point of this book is a, a call to a call to arms for a, cult, a call to responsibility. And normally, most people are talking about that in terms of kings and what they are supposed to be doing, or knights being called to action. But it's the same thing for the for the small folk, like like Paul says. Um, they are eventually called upon, but they don't have as much choice whether to listen or not. They just have to do it, or or they die, so they uh, they go and do it, and they either succeed, or they die, or they break. So yeah, that's a, a really good uh, comparison, I think. One way they get left out a lot in in popular TV and movies is is really common. Like you have a scene where people fight, and then the fighting stops, and then they start talking. Why there should be guards or you know people just lying there noisily dying in pain you know <laughs> like mm. they're not all dead right it's the old stormtrooper thing where you know you <laughs> they get shot once and they're just dead that's it there's no they're not wounded they're not like hurt nope that's just one blow and they're dead <laughs> okay so we'll, we're gonna take one more question then lady then we'll do a sign off for lady gwen and then we'll take uh maybe a couple more questions do a sign off for joe and our outro stuff and call it a day so this last question, I think this is a really good one. Nina uh, Friel had a really good observation. Uh, we t- we pointed out the difference between Shay, one difference between Shay and Taisha, and that very cutesy dream that he's having, where he thinks about how how cute they were together, and how there's lots of kissing, and how I had never noticed before how the fact there's lots of kissing is a very strong argument against her having been a sex worker. And Nina has another similar take here: the fact that Shay almost never calls Tyrion Tyrion. It happens only a couple times where in this scene where she, where he's remembering the stream of Taisha, Taisha is going on and on about how similar their names are and how uh, how she likes his name. And it's very symbolic of how she loved him for him and not because of his name was Tyrion Lannister. She loved the Tyrion, not the Lannister, which is that's a great I think that's really poignant. And it just shows how much George packed into those dreams about uh, those those. The, the thoughts of she, of Taisha and how these things of Shay would would trigger some of these thoughts. Uh, Joe, we'll uh, start with you, and then Lady Gwen will go to you, and you can do your sign off. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting uh, bringing up Tyrion's name uh, in this context. That's a great uh, catch by Nina, but I, I, I've always wondered if it's ever bothered Tyrion that he has the most similar name to Tywin, and I've always wondered why Tywin chose to give Tyrion the. Uh, closest like Jamie it sounds nothing like Tywin obviously and doesn't have the tie that Tytos does or Tywin does or Tyrion does 
So I've always been really interested what that choice was and whether it annoys Tyrion that he's got that extra connection to Tywin who obviously <laughs> wants less connections with. But um, yeah, no, I, I think that's really interesting that he connects his name with Taisha so much, who obviously also has the tie in there. So it's all, it's all in connected. Very good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Lady Gwen. I mean, I just want to say that this, it's a great observation, and the one that you made as well. Um, about the kissing, and it really makes me wish that uh, Tyrion ha- was as observant as we are. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious to me that Taisha was just what she appeared to be, you know, a crofter's daughter. So um, I wish that he would come to that realization. Yeah, and um, and the flip side of that, Shay is what she, uh, kind of what she appears mm-hmm. to be. She is a young girl that is doing what she has to do to survive in a very, very dangerous world where she has very little agency. And the one thing she does have going for her is, well, a, a rich and powerful person has, is giving her attention. And uh, I think any of us in her spot would try to get as much out of that as we could. True. Okay, so Lady Gwen, you have to go. Let us uh, hear True. from where, uh, let's, let's he- tell everybody where to find you and what mm-hmm. Radio Westeros has coming up and what, hey, what you all have just recently done. Yeah, well, you can uh, find us at RadioWesteros.com. Check out all all of our podcasts over there. Uh, Most recently, we we had finished a a series on uh, all the prologues. uh, Oh, well, a a mini series. We didn't do all quite all the prologues, but uh, we've got that going on. We have a new episode coming out um let me see i think on tuesday will be our public release it's we're doing our patreon uh rollout right now uh that's all about the heroes of a song of ice and fire we're going to talk about the hero's journey and uh george's perspective on that and all the different types of heroes that he lets us see everyone is a hero in their own uh story as after all so we get lots of them so that's it. So check that out in a couple of days' time. Uh, if you're bored over the next couple of days and you want something to do, uh, check out our latest uh, Quiz of Ice and Fire. Me and uh, uh, Chloe from Girls Gone Canon and Haley Bowery from The Manimals got together a couple of weeks ago, uh, tied one on, and did a quiz all about <laughs> all, um, <laughs> alcohol and various <laughs> other substances. Uh, we went pretty far afield, but it's a it's a good, long, deep quiz uh, and pretty festive so. <laughs> cool that sounds yeah. fantastic yeah y'all yeah. check that out definitely check all that yeah. out all right and we will uh be talking to you again soon of course we yeah. when i was up in boston lady gwen and i worked on the dance of the dragons episode we got a lot done and i think we're yes. probably about two-thirds of the way done with episode two roughly so i think maybe we'll be able to drop that in january we'll see I- i'm I- i'm i shouldn't i'm, I'm not going to make a promise on that uh, so maybe <laughs> january we'll see yes yeah, same um, but yeah Okay, y'all stick with us. Yeah. Uh, we'll we're gonna have. I want to yeah. talk to Joe about a few characters who weren't POVs. So just a little longer on this episode, and we'll say goodbye to Lady Gwen. And um, yeah, let's see here. So Joe, let's talk briefly about a few characters who aren't POVs yet, mm-hmm. but are yeah. already important. Uh, Jamie is interesting in that he's introduced. Kind of like Roose Bolton, at the end, we really get a deep dive into who this guy really is, even though he's been around. We've heard of him, and we get a first real kind of honed-in conversation. What is your take on rereading Jamie? He's pretty different. Uh, he doesn't become sympathetic at all, in my opinion, until his chapters start. Or, But mm. does knowing what's coming, though, how, do, how does he uh, look to you? Well, I think we know that's one of the, the real big changes from the original um, the original. Uh, plot that George had was what Jamie was going to be up to, and obviously this redemption arc, uh, this redemption arc, probably wasn't part of that at all. Because <laughs> you can see he's kind of he's really quite like Joffrey, I guess, kind of that bland, just evil in the in the first book. We don't get anything more than that. He just pushes a kid out of the window. He smiles when Jory dies and breaks in his leg and all this, and he's the the villain in the Riverlands as well. Um, for he's he's the main antagonist for Rob. So until this chapter, this last Catelyn chapter, uh, like you say, we don't have anything on him, but then we get this real, they go all in. This um, Catelyn, final Catelyn chapter is more like a Jamie prologue almost, I think I said. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's a really focused on 
why he's done what he's done and how he thinks of himself. And even if it's not uh, completely sympathetic in that first moment, it is, it's just opening that door and getting ready for that store mark. And because don't forget, he's the first, um, apart from the prologue, he's the first chapter in Storm of yeah. Swords. So it goes pretty quickly from this to that really in, in uh, reading talk. So um, yeah, George is, I think he knows we can't go straight into that in Storm. We need some kind of setup. Let's get this in now. Let's really get in depth on this character. And obviously that pays off in books to come. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's a good, that's a very good take. And I think it's, it's also interesting to note uh, from Jamie's perspective too, that he's got a lot in common with some of these other characters that Catelyn or Catelyn's daughters interact with who are all sort of a pastiche of, of interactions together as a group. For example, mm -hmm. Jamie has a lot in common with Sandor that I didn't necessarily catch on prior reads. Just there. Yeah. They come from different social places, but they have the same sort of um, thing, the way they apply to the world. They're, they're extremely yeah, they're talented approach. killers that mm -hmm. are kind of jaded by the fact that this is what gets them far in life. It's like, this is success in life is being good at killing. Well, the world sucks. <laughs> you can see why they're cynical. And um, that, that also uh, is a segue to a character who's very much not like that, but whose mm -hmm. role is important uh, because he's not like that. And because of, as an observer, John is now beyond the wall and we need an observer with the Night's Watch. And that of course mm -hmm. is Samuel Tarley. So what do you think of Samwell in A Clash of Kings? I think uh, Lady Gwen mentioned it earlier that early on, you don't really see all that much of Sam at all, really, in this book, just at the beginning. But he, again, is he's on an arc. He's progressed. He is settling into the ranging, which he was really, really worried about at the end of Game of Thrones, way better than John was when you would obviously think the opposite if you knew them just at face value. And he's starting to find his niche. He's starting to find that he does have value. Obviously, that's going to be greatly interrupted by what happens at the fist and the march back. But uh, he he will find that again um, when he gets back to the wall and he starts. Um, he gets a bit closer to Maester Aemon and he goes south. So you can see the uh, setup for that, and obviously he gets to meet Gilly. Um, although that's not as as much in this book as it is in um, the show. Kind of do that a lot a bit earlier than the books, but he makes the connection still. And um, yeah, you can just. He, it's, it's quick, but it's important. Right on. Um, there's two more characters. We're, I'm, we're only going to talk about one of them. We'll save Melisandre for uh, another time because there's just so much to her, talk about her in A Storm of Swords and beyond. Mm. But I did want to talk a little bit more about Cersei. You already mentioned that uh, Cersei is a perfect example of a character you would love to see a chapter oh, yeah. or two from her side of things while dealing with Tyrion. If you want to expand on that or talk about other stuff regarding Cersei and what's coming for her, well, this is the great time for it. I think her biggest thing in this book is that everything she's put, probably years of planning and maneuvering and lying and all that kind of stuff to uh, to achieve, which was to get rid of Robert and put Joffrey on the throne and, and basically rule as regent. She did all that. She achieved basically her life's mission and none of the stuff she thought uh, that would come with it has come because Tyrion's there to mess everything up. Jamie's not there to uh, kind of rule with her. Uh, Joffrey's out of control already. Uh, the Stannis is at the walls, and um, that's even without applying all the prophecy stuff that we learn much later on. If you look at it through that lens, you can see so much easier why she um, why she treats Tyrion like she does, and why she's so afraid of him. Not that that excuses it, of course, but you can see why, and you can get a, a big window into her mind. And that's why I, I really just love to see her take. Um, at the beginning when Tyrion turns up right through to the end when it's the battle of the black war and I, I again i think i said this in our notes i didn't want to repeat myself but she is essentially in the same position she would be in if robert was still alive she hasn't really changed anything and that must be so frustrating to her especially that Tyrion is the mm. the reason for all this non-progression when um in game of thrones she was rid of him finally uh he's been hanging around and he's gone off somewhere got himself captured she must have been incredibly happy when she heard that even if uh, she acts like she's not and this uh not come off for her so everything's kind of gone wrong and it's, it must be galling that her father of all people is the one that inf in quote unquote inflicted Tyrion on her exactly and if, and for reasons that she probably believes um it's 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 galling to her that Tyrion's right that about a lot of things like yeah they things haven't been run very well and part part of that is because joffrey's so hard to manage jo the joffrey <laughs> executing ned thing i mean that wasn't cersei's fault 
uh, <laughs> I don't know if Tyrion, I don't know if Tyrion would have been able to prevent that one either. But at least no. they now no. that revealed Joffrey doing that. Uh, you know, setting aside the fact that he was encouraged to do that probably by Littlefinger, the fact that he is that kind of loose cannon wasn't so clear to them at the time. And, uh, well, it is now. And, of course, in the next book, Joffrey's loose cannonness is going to be on <laughs> full display as he and Tyrion are going to go back and forth quite a bit. And instead of Tyrion getting playing politics, he's got to play petty. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's right. not so, you know, a bit frustrating for him and um, maybe for some readers as well. <laughs> but, of course, is Tyrion ends up doing Sorry. interesting stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, let me, can I ask you a quick question? About, Absolutely. Not uh, one specific, but uh, a collection. I'm wondering if this is the worst book for the the King's Guard and what happens to them. Uh, let me let me run down quickly what happens to our King's Guard. So Preston Greenfield he dies. Yep. Amanda Moore he dies. Yep. Uh, Sandok again abandons at the end. Boros is in prison slash sacked. He's just kind of out of it. Jamie, who's uh, Lord Commander by this point, is in prison for the whole book. <laughs> and then Merrin and Eris are just kind of ass hats for outfit, and Eris <laughs> gets sent away. So. Uh, and all of them kind of participate in abusing Sansa. So I'm wondering what you think if this is the the worst case scenario for the Kingsguard that we've seen so far. I think you're right. I mean, we we there's so many themes that echo this theme of what you're pointing to with the Kingsguard of things having a low point or characters having mm -hmm. a low point, institutions having a low point. Uh, and that fits really well with the theme. I think you're right. I, we're looking at so many characters uh the institution being nothing like what it was. It's, it's it, early on, you know, Ned talks about how Ares's Kingsguard was, mm. was great. And now there's reasons yep. to think that they weren't quite as great as uh, they seemed, but compared to this Kingsguard, they were great. <laughs> yeah. They were great. Yeah. <laughs> in both in attitude and in fighting ability uh, and loyal, even in loyalty, you know, and, and there's some questions about those other Kingsguard's loyalty too. But yeah, that's a good point. You know, it fits in really well. George is so good with these layers of making every mm. part of the story line up thematically in ways that we don't even notice. And maybe that's part of why we don't notice because it it fits so nicely. Uh, it just seems natural. Um, yeah. It's like it's like a real a painting that has so many layers. Everything fits together so well. You don't notice how much detail is actually there. That's why we love this series, folks. Um, yeah, that's right. So let's see, a couple more random takes, uh, and then we'll call it a day. Um, I mentioned most of the book endings, that, uh, as in characters starting and ending in a very similar spot. One I didn't necessarily mention was Stannis. We mentioned Davos and, and Melisandre, but Stannis also kind of the same. He starts off weak, unsupported at Dragonstone, and then ends up weak, unsupported at Dragonstone. <laughs> he, he gains allies and then loses them all in the span of the book and ends up basically where he was in terms of having the same cast of characters around him, his same advisors, same loyalists. Uh, he still has his wife and his daughter and Melisandre and uh, lots of regrets. <laughs> That's one thing that he had before. Now he has more of. And... Um, there's definitely more death in the Clash of Kings. Hat tip to Robin20 on Westeros.org, who did a thread years ago, I think eight years ago. Yeah. 54 named characters die in a Game of Thrones, 72 in the Clash of Kings. I actually found one that, they, that he left off, so I think it's 73. <laughs> Uh, Orel wasn't on the list. Uh, arguably, Orel is still alive because he's a second life. So that's maybe you can call that 72 and a half. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird to calling death in a series that has resurrections is hard to count, right? And yeah. Second Life. So, and one of the, the, the differences in that uh, list is that there's more commoners. More commoners with names that, didn't, that weren't around in the Game of Thrones. Like we have Micah and a couple others in the Game of Thrones. But in, in A Clash of Kings, there's all these characters that Arya was around. All the castle folk at Winterfell and Harrenhal, like Poxy Tim and Alebelly and Micken. Some of those characters were introduced in Game of Thrones, but they have a larger role and die in this book. Lamy Greenhands, little characters like All for Joffrey, and and Dorea is one of the few characters who dies in Danny's arc. Uh, Prayed, Alar Deem, Dauber, Kyle, his brothers, brother without banners, characters like that, and a lot of Ironborn, Gelmar the Grim, Red Rolf, Black Lauren, just uh, soldier types, you know. A huge list of knights, Mandon Moore, from Mandon Moore to Stevron Frey, Robar, Royce, Emin Kai, Aaron Santagar, Preston Greenfield, Courtney Penrose, Roderick Cassell. I uh, didn't name nearly all of them. And the bookending maesters we mentioned already, Crescent and Lewin. Only one other maester dies that we know of, and that's Toth Muir. 
And he dies eh, sort of in the middle. So it's kind of like one in the <laughs> beginning, one in the middle, one in the end. Temples. Yeah. <laughs> too perfect. Too perfect. Okay. So, oh, shout out to my friend Evelyn Ng, who stopped by to say hi. Evelyn is a, some of you may know Evelyn Ng. She is a, a streamer and used to be on TV a lot as a poker player back when poker was on TV a lot. Um, so, hey, Evelyn, good to see you. And let us say goodbye. Thank you to everyone who came today. We really appreciate the live support. And if you couldn't make it live, well, we appreciate the non-live support as well. It really makes a big difference when you like and share our podcasts and videos. You might be surprised at how much it, uh, how much of a difference it makes. Joe, please tell everyone where to find you, what you've got coming up, and please mention your book again and where to find that. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, no one's sick of me mentioning my book yet. Okay. <laughs> We're not. So. Uh, <laughs> you can find me quickest probably on other faces, normally doing a Scraps and Scrolls uh, episode, helping Aziz out with the notes. And uh, believe it or not, I still leave stuff out as well. There is So if anyone wants to start a third podcast and pick up my <laughs> extra notes, uh, please do. Um, there'll be more of those coming, obviously. we still I still have the last one of Clash of Kings. So if you haven't got quite enough Clash of Kings out, that'll be around uh, next week, probably. I'll give myself a little break over the holidays. Uh, now that the Castle's book is finally done, I can get back to the original uh, point of Isle of Faces. We're going to have more guests back on, telling us how they got into the series itself my own lady buckley my wife will be finally coming back and talking to me again it's been a long time cool. and um i'm uh, getting back into essay writing i've got something on Tyrion and the black war funnily enough coming up so that would be uh, i say soon but uh, don't trust me on that other than that you can find me on twitter at sir buckley probably talking about uh, my own podcast again and yes there is a, a book about castles that so many of you have been very kind to not only purchase but talk about and um, share and send me pictures of which is uh, particularly lovely actually seeing it in someone's hand is a uh, uh, well, I can't really describe the feeling. So thank you again. Thank you, Aziz and the Share for sharing that and promoting it as well. It's been very nice. Lady Gwen um, and Yoke Boy have as well. So thank you to them. And yeah, it's uh, very kind of everyone. And thank you for having me on. I won't leave it seven months this time. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, we'll definitely have you back again soon and uh, probably for the Astorbus Swords wrap up. Uh, mostly. Yeah, we'll probably just keep doing the same pattern here. It's working out really well. We have great discussions. Uh, the two of us slash the three of us slash the four of us when Ashea is on mic. So uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you to Ashea for doing so much. As always, she's like a kraken back there with many arms doing so much at once. Today, she her voice wasn't heard, but her presence was felt uh, as always. Thank you to Michael Klarfeld for the maps you see behind me and for our video intro and lots of other wonderful things he's done for the community. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for the Valar We Read Us music. Joey Townsend for the regular History of Westeros music. Jo Jesse Koval for our the cover of Joey Townsend's song that plays during our outro. Thank you to our History of Westeros mods who do a fantastic job every week of leading the chapter by chapter discussions. Every chapter gets posted in our Facebook group and discussed. They also take that opportunity to uh, post some of the best quotes from each episode or each chapter, as well as a great opportunity to display the wonderful uh, artwork associated with the Song of Ice and Fire. Sometimes they post the official art. Sometimes they post fan art. You never know, but it's always awesome. Also, thank to our regular posters on Facebook and Flick and Twitter and everyone else. You know who you are. You get shouted out regularly when I read your questions out. And I, I hope you all continue to send us great questions slash thoughts slash topics to consider. Uh, also, of course... We have our patrons to thank. As we start each episode thanking patrons, we so do we end that way. Now we save the bulk of the shout-outs for the end, and we get to hear our fun music playing while we go through these. So let me start off with our peers of the realm. That includes the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, Lord Stephen Stark, titles, titles, Hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as the best, Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog is Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lord Brendan Lannister is the Blood Lion, Ruler of Castle Everroar, Warden of the South. 
Lord James Tuttle is King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet, led by flagship Caraxes, and the Bloodstone Fleet, led by flagship Prince Damon. He has recently been teaching all of his captains the lessons to be learned at the Battle of the Blackwater. Don't sail into a bay without a scouting party going in first. And watch out for those chains just below the water. Don't just ignore that. King Beyond the Wall, Sidney Jesse, is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring and the Haunted Forest, wields a dagger of dragon glass and the Valyrian steel blade, Red Frost. He cannot believe that the wildlings allowed Jon Snow to join and believe Corrin Halfhand's bull. He's just shaking his head, saying, how did you guys fall for that one? Lady Sarah Connolly, the Willful, says, wit beyond measure is man's greatest treasure, and she is Jenny's patron. Our White Walker patrons include a ray of flint of the mountain flints captured by the Weaver, only to be raised in the valley of the Milkwater, blue eyes, and golden memories. Alexander Greyblood is first of the first men, now crowned in ice called Silence Bringer, Wood Blinder, and the Snow of Night, wielder of the ice forged greatsword Pale Frost. Our small council includes Lord Daniel, the sneaky Russian, master of ships, Lord Benjamin of House Hornwood, master of laws, Lord Fabian Flowers, the bastard of Green Shield, master of coin, Lord Johan of House Orcos, called Shadowhawk, master of whispers. Our lords and ladies in their castles include Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell, Breaker of the Second Stone, Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Bread Fort, Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate, Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass, Ashlyn Winter, the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall, Lady Mikkel of Moonacre, Leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance, the Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest is wielder of the Valyrian steel machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snuggle Bunny is Guardian Ranger of the Hidden Hundred Acre Werewood, dual wielder of Valyrian short swords, Glorious Morning, and Little Lightwise, sharpshooter of the Werewood and Ironwood laminated longbow Todd Von Oben. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is first forester of the Old Gods, sworn to House Iron Werewood. Listen for the silence. Lady Liana Kelly of Wolf Island is Protectress of the Steelhold. Casey Stark is of House Acres. Lady Kay of House Ar Archer is Lady of Earth Dog Hall, Huntress of the Wolfswood, and Guardian of Maddie Squirrelsbane, the Mighty Dire Weenie. Lady Raywin of House Dillsdane is the Star Spear. Peter Rivers, the Pale Dragon, is heir to Blood Raven. Lady Carlin Carey of Castle Stone Sharp, whose horse is shod in Valyrian steel, is Lady Rider of the Rising Hills. King's Justice Sir Troy the Steady is wielder of the Valyrian steel blade Fate. I will read Ashea's Queen's High Council, since she is not mic Bloody Ben Blackwood is Master of Whispers. Rebea Star Eyes is Lady of Waves and Mistress of Ships. Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat in the shadows, we bear our claws. Katrin the Wise of House Trondheim is Master of Coin. Grand Maester M. Elizabeth is middle daughter of Lyanna Mormont, first lady to forge both the silver and Valyrian steel links. And Laura Boros is Lady of Infinity, Master of Laws. You can tell who our uh, History of Westeros mods support the most, because three of the six mods are uh, on a Shea's Queen's High Council. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Watch out. <laughs> She's going to go for a takeover. <laughs> Our King's Guard is led by Lord Commander Miriamar, backed up by Sir Glennon of House Leanne, called Lion Cloak, longest tenured of our White Swords. Sir Dean the White is Knight of the Black Star. Sir Jord of House Pepsi is the Beverage Knight. Gregor Snow, called Snow Bear, is a Bastard of Winterfell. Sir Jen Seaworth is Knight of the Southern Snows. And Lisa is Water Witch of Dorne. Our Red Wedding Band is led by Sir Newt of the Rock, lead lutist, wielding a werewood lute with Valyrian steel strings. Our Queen's Guard is led by Lord Captain Commander Hema Helminth, the Cell Sword Sentinel. Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Dune. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Sir Rambo, Knight of House G G Ganon, First Blood. Sir Leon of House Walker, wielder of the twin Ver Valyrian steel blades Fire and Ice and the Werewood Bow Rain. Amber the Adamant is Knight of the Mist and Mother of Squids. The Wintry Wolverine, We Finish What You Begin. Nora Neko. Our beard guard is Lord J Commander George the Golden, Sir Joshua Oakhart the White Oak, Lady Rita of the Copper Mane the Unbound, Dance the Fervor, Sir Joff, Warden of the AC, Wielder of Triad, the Multifaceted Beard of Platinum Red and Brown, Stay Frosty. Sir Tim Corgyle is Mad Boy of the Western Desert. And last but certainly not least, we have our History of Westeros Night's Watch, which is led by Lord Commander Benjen Umber, the Silent Giant, Wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword, Winter's Kiss, First Builder, Magor Snow, a.k.a. Magor the Cool, the Fire in the Snow. And First Ranger, Sir Source Delica of House Gramercy. 
once more. We'll be back on January 7th, the Tuesday at 6 Eastern for the uh, Nine Penny Kings stream with Stephen Atwell and Valar Reredis resumes with A Storm of Swords on January 12th at the usual time of Sunday, 3 Eastern. So you have plenty of time to get going with your Storm of Swords reading, which I hope you do. I encourage you to do so because that's what we do around here. We say Valar Reredis.